glasses or I'm never going to. And I'm, I'm going to. I don't know what you call it. In the statement. In the verse. Participation. Dealing with the. Um, custodial. You can see how it's here. Uh, the award of a public contract for the custodial services portion, but not participate. Yes. Feedback. There's feedback. feedback going on. Why is yeah, it? I'm telling you. Okay. No, I'll tell you that. In the portion that addresses the acquisition of real property. So the other day, I'm starting to call this. Would you please let me make this statement? Is everybody finished talking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I'm going to start over. I'm going to participate in the portion of this closed session that deals with the um, award of a contract for custodial services, but not in the portion that addresses the acquisition of real property for the construction of that non school and additional easements needed for construction of the high school because of potential um, conflict with clients of my firm. All right, now do we have a Motion. Madam Chair, we haven't had a vote on the agenda yet. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second motion. Second. Yeah. <laughs> that was the same as the first, but we'll just roll into it. Um, all in favor of the motion. Aye. 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 The agenda, aye. All opposed. All right. Now do we have a motion? To protect its bargaining position or negotiation strategy, I move that the school board convene a closed meeting pursuant to section 2.2-371183 a of the Code of Virginia to discuss and or consider the acquisition of real property for construction of an elementary school and additional easements needed for the construction of high school number six and pursuant to Virginia Code section 2.2-371189 a to discuss the award of a public contract for custodial services that involves the expenditure of public funds. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We are now in the session.
Okay, you. there you go. Oh, well, well, I'll tell you again. Okay, I'm sorry, camera. Wait. I gave the comments on the calendar that I had in here that I wanted to write. I don't need to do that for tonight, right? Like, go to the Did you get the certification? Yeah, let's do it. Do we read back in first, right? Let's do that. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, certification. We're waiting. Read back in. Pursuant to section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia, I move that the closed meeting of the school board of Stafford County on October 11th, 2022, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of Stafford County hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Second. Dr. Chase? I move that the school board authorize the superintendent or his designee on behalf of the school board, one, to make an offer to purchase an identified and specific parcel or parcels of real estate for construction of an elementary school and additional easements for the construction of high school six at appraised value. Two, to engage in negotiations with the owners for such purchases. And three, to return to the board for review of the negotiated contract terms for approval. Second. Any discussion? All right, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And I'm abstaining from that. <coughs> So motion carries on um, six zero. Okay. One. So we can move into our work session. Yes. All right. Call the order. We don't need um, authorization to participate electronically. Roll call for the work session. Mr. Dr. Chase. Here. Ms. Guy. Here. Ms. Halstead. Here. Ms. Healy. Here. Ms. Randall. Here. Ms. Sigmund. Here. And Dr. Ware. Here. And Mr. Ewell. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda for the work session? Second. Motion by Dr. Warner, second by Ms. Halstead. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried unanimously. All right, information items. Uh, the first item uh, up is uh, a standalone VPSA bond issuance uh, not to exceed a million, a hundred million dollars. And Mr. Fulmer is gonna um, bring a couple, couple of uh, points to your attention regarding uh, this bond issuance and to get our high school six project going. Uh, so uh, we had Mr. Munch, who is the uh, chief financial officer for the county, actually um, present to the FAPC and explain a few things as far as a little bit different borrowing uh, procedure for this than what we've done in the past. Um, and so I'm gonna have him present um, on the BPSA is kind of fun. Okay. If you want to you start can't shut the door, actually. Yeah, you, no, I was going to ask Rachel to come in. John, so I'm going to kick it over to John um, while I make sure we're sharing the screen properly. Great. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is John Munch. I'm CFO at Stafford County. And uh, I just wanted to give a brief presentation about um, the borrowing procedure for High School 6. Um, as Chris said, it's going to be a little bit different from what we've uh, typically done in the past. Uh, I'm going to try to just basically give a Cliff's Notes version of this, if that's okay. And then if you all have any questions, I'd be more than happy to either answer those or take them down and get an answer to follow up. Um, so basically, as you all know, um, in the adopted CIP, the High School 6 project has been approved at about $165.1 million. Of that $165.1, approximately $155.5 million is slated for debt financing. Um, we've already issued about 9.3. So what that means is that we have about $146.2 million of debt remaining to issue on the project. Um, the CIP originally contemplated issuing that debt um, a little bit over the next four years, 
but um, because of the interest rate environment that we appear to be in, um, what we're trying to figure out is whether or not it would be advantageous to look at a couple of different um, ideas for how we can do that and potentially save a little bit of money on the project. It won't be a ton, but every little bit helps um, in, the, in the era that we're living through right now. So one idea um, was to just go ahead and issue the entire 146.2 million in fiscal 23. But as you can see from the uh, projected expenditures on the project, the issue that we run into there is simply that we don't think that we can spend it down quickly enough in order to avoid some of the hangups that we would have when we do a tax exempt financing in terms of the interest earnings we get on the project. We wouldn't be able to realize the full benefit of those interest is earnings. Is there a percentage of the borrow that we're supposed to pay down over different periods of time, or is it just a... It, so basically, the, the, the best rule I can say, the most simple rule with that is um, the 24-month safe harbor. Okay. So if you borrow the money, um, as long as you spend all of those proceeds within the 24-month safe harbor, then you get to keep and apply all of the interest earnings to the project. You don't have to pay the IRS back anything. It's right. trying to prevent you from arbitraging the market. Right, right, right. Yeah. I just didn't know if there was a percentage or if it was a if it was at all or not. Yeah, the, the simple rule is the 24 month safe harbor, and that's typically what I try to do. So, um, as as you probably can see, um, the short version on the interest rates is, of course, nobody knows exactly where interest rates are going to go in, in the future, but it certainly appears um, in the current period that we're in, we're definitely in a rising interest rate environment. And most people, most observers would uh, probably agree that they expect that rising interest rate environment to continue into the foreseeable future. So with that being the case, um, you know, we basically are going to be advantaged if, if that happens to go ahead and issue more of the debt than we originally planned. So right now, um, even though interest rates are definitely going up, it's helpful to look at it in the context of, of history as well. And what we're seeing right now is that our borrowing rate, um, you know, at the time that we prepared this analysis, was still slightly lower than the overall 30-year average on a 20-year borrow. Um, those numbers have slightly changed, and we're probably pretty, basically right on par with the 30-year average for a 20-year debt right now, right around 4% if we were to issue today. Um, the Fed is expected to raise interest rates again um, when they meet on November 2nd. Um, what I'm hearing from the financial advisors is that that expected increase is already kind of baked into these rates. In other words, they wouldn't expect that when they meet on uh, November 2nd and in increase it by 75 basis points, that that's going to have an immediate jolt of up 75 in terms of what we would experience. Um, but uh, certainly what we're seeing, though, is that the interest rates that we're, that we're um, experiencing today are, are not what we've become accustomed to over the last... Uh, five to ten years, especially the last two years, where our borrowing rate has been as low as, on average, about one and a half percent in some situations. Um, so again, um, uh, switching to kind of the decision points, you know, what will happen with interest rates over the borrowing period? Again, we don't really know, but if they continue to rise, then there's a lot of benefit to issuing earlier. Um, if they fall, then there would actually be some benefit to delaying, but most people are not in the, in the camp saying that they believe that interest rates are going to go down. Um, how quickly do they need to be expended? Again, we talked about the 24-month uh, rule uh, in order to retain and utilize all of the interest earnings. And then in terms of the borrowing program, a lot of times typically we would go into the BPSA pool financing program, um, but in this particular case, because the dollar amount is over $20 million, um, we're eligible to participate in what's called the VPSA standalone program, and that allows us to use the AAA bond ratings that we have um, to get a lower cost of funds on the project. Um, the VPSA pooled program typically um, sells at the equivalent of a AA plus, so the rates are slightly higher with that. Um, the other advantage with the standalone program is that we get to be in full control of the timing and the structure of the issuance. So if we look at um, interest rates and it looks like we've got a maybe a temporary dip in the market, we may be able to react a little bit more quickly and take advantage to that dip in, in the market, um, as opposed to waiting. If we were to do like a spring pool, we're at the behest of the PSA's timing. They're gonna sell it um, at the beginning of May, and that's just when they're gonna sell it, regardless of what the rates are looking like at that time. Um, and then, yes, again, uh, looking at the savings, uh, probably the biggest thing I would point out here is the interest earnings. 
um, where if we follow the adopt the CIP, we'd be looking at an estimated $1.6 million of interest earnings. Um, that number jumps to approximately $3.0 million if we do the two issuance model. Um, and then the total debt service, you can see there's about $2.8 million of um, savings in the overall debt service <coughs> for the project. Um, so we think that that's beneficial. And then in terms of the proposed schedule, where we go from here, um, you know, this is a discussion point at today's uh, school board meeting uh, work session um, to answer any questions that you all have. On the October 18th, I'll be asking the board to authorize the county administrator to advertise a public hearing, actually two public hearings for November 15th, so that we can consider um, the issuance of debt with the board of supervisors. And there'll be some appropriations that have to change because we'll be veering away from the adopted CIP. Um, and then I plan to, if with your all's approval, come back on Tuesday, November 8th to the school board meeting to discuss again the authorization of an application to VPSA and also a formal request to the county to issue general obligation of debt. And with that, I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'm going to summarize real quickly. So historically, we've done a pooled program through VPSA. Um, so anybody that's been on the board for a couple of years or are familiar with that. And so we pull with the other school divisions in the state to try to get a better borrowing, uh, uh, better interest rate, um, or cut down on our um, cost of issuance. Um, and so what we're doing differently here is we're doing a standalone, which is still through VPSA. They help organize it, um, but we're doing a standalone just for Stafford County. So Stafford County is going to be the only one actually, you know, selling bonds for, um, to take out that debt. Um, but that allows the county to use the AAA bond rating and get a slightly lower rate. The other piece of it that's different is we're borrowing more up front instead of throughout the project because we expect the interest rates to rise over uh, during the period of the project, which means the cost of borrowing is going to slowly get higher and higher. So going on our own to use AAA, lower interest rate, borrowing now instead of 12 months, 24 months from now, because um, also interest rates will go up, so we're keeping a lower interest rate there. And even though it's a standalone, the, the school board still approves kind of the application, the process for that. And then the county does the final approval um, and receives the funds. The school board doesn't actually borrow the money. The county borrows the money and then provides the funding and appropriation to the school board. So FABC also uh, received the same presentation. Yep. Yes. Did FABC have any uh, conclusion? <laughs> I mean, should have done this three years ago. Yeah, my big question coming out of FABC is why are we only talking about high school six? When we, when, especially because we have the approval for the elementary school at the very least. Like, should we be looking? And that's one of the questions I wanted to bring to the full board is, you know, what is the process? Do we want to? And what would the process be to expand that scope um, either at the same time or immediate? Like, come back next month and talk about elementary school 18 in the same process so that so we are the answer is yes but not now and you wouldn't do them together because you're further along in term sure because within the next several months you're going to be moving dirt for high school six mm -hmm. you're not going to be moving dirt in the same time frame for the elementary school but you're going to go through a very similar process um, and to have to a very future. similar discussion, but, we could but just a few months the, again. EPSA more likely with the elementary school. Um, okay. We could use that, or we could do another. Yeah, and one. it depends on which is more market advantageous. Right. Um, you know, doing the pool of EPSA, who cares what your bond rating is? Because you're getting your bonds at a very different rate. Um, you're getting them at what is it, double A plus? Yes, double yeah, A plus. Double A plus. Right now, we're definitely taking advantage of the fact that the county has a triple triple A bond rating, which is a great opportunity right now and gives us just a hair's margin of a better rate. Well, financially, that is the right decision. And you certainly could replicate this exact process or you could go with the pool process. The pool process is going to have specific timelines throughout the year that they're going to solicit. Um, applications to be a part of that pool process versus doing a standalone, which is a little bit more on our calendar. But you're going to go through a very similar process to answer Mrs. Sigmund's question as we are doing right now. And you're going to do this same process again as we get further down the road on the high school project and you take out more debt issuance to cover the remainder cost of the project when your $100 million is spent 
and you're concluding the construction of your project, you're going to do the same process again. So we just have to be patient because I have the same question as her. Well, and you're, you're not going to take out a bunch of debt right now that you're not going to spend right away. But so it's like you're, you're, you're right now going through the process to take out $100 million so that you can spend $100 million over the next 24 months to build this school. But if you were going to take out a debt issuance right now for the next elementary school, well, you're not going to spend your your money right away. You're going to spend it in a few months. So you're going to start that process. In a few okay. Months. Oh, it starts ticking. It's a great, great no, question. Yeah, the clock starts ticking. Yeah. Okay. So this will come to the to the board for action at the November meeting. Okay. okay. Sounds good. And if you okay. have any questions between then and now, let me know. I, if I don't know the answer, I'll give Mr. Munch. Get back. Thank you, Mr. Munch. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me. I, I, I do have one question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Do you anticipate any um, response from the supervisors with respect to this borrowing this recommend? Well, I spoke, with, I spoke with the full board at a work session on September 20th, and we basically outlined the same thing with them that we went over with you today and with, that we went over with the um, Finance and Budget Committee meeting last week. Um, they had a few questions, but nothing that I uh, would have deemed to be concerning. Um, I can never really speak for them and know exactly how they will vote, so I, I can't say that. But based on the questions that they had, my expectation is that they would probably vote to move forward with this. And to that... Um, to that and uh, it is on right now scheduled to be on consent agenda for the off the authorization to advertise the public hearing is on the consent agenda for the 18th we will get more uh i think view of whether or not they have any hesitation about it at that time if anybody asks for it to be pulled and then how soon would the um, public hearing be after that the public hearing would be scheduled for november 15th so it would be just following the school boards um hopefully vote to um, formally request the debt. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that date of the, the consent agenda. That's um, next 18th, Tuesday, the November. 18th. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so it's the 18th of um, October. October. I was thinking it was November. Oh, I'm sorry if I said that in the consent agenda. No, I, yes. thank you. Yeah. So yes, they're gonna hopefully vote to advertise the public hearings on October 18th. Um, we would come back to the full school board on November 8th for um, the resolutions to authorize the application to BPSA as well as the formal request from the board to issue the geo debt. And then the following Tuesday on November 15th, the county board would hold the two public hearings and then presumably would vote on the two resolutions to change the appropriations and then to authorize the issuance. And then VPSA would then do um, a meeting for us um, either late November or early December to uh, approve our application with them. And what about that little ten million that was not accounted for in the that was one sixty five and one fifty five and nine and the borrowing? Wasn't there a little ten million dollar gap? The it's already been issued. We, we've already either used cash or bond money for like the design costs or some of that. Okay. Right. All right. So, yeah. so this accounts for all the future the, the total one hundred sixty five together with what we've already spent. So we don't have to come up with any more. And there's a likelihood that the project, because of inflation, inflationary factors, which the county and our staff are we're all well aware of this, inflationary factors, building materials, a whole host of issues, will cost more than what was originally projected. And we're, we're all on the same page in terms of our understanding. That increased that. cost is already reflected in our CIP yeah. request. So to go back to the board of supervisors but we yeah. use the same inflation factors as the board of supervisors on their projects as the county staff on their projects so. but traditionally our figure is higher than what's been approved for us by the supervisors for the construction yeah. if, if i recall well so last year they approved the, the full requested amount but now we're a year later and because of inflation for another year it went up so they did approve it all the way up to 165 million last year but we already expected to be But now it's 365 days later, yeah. and we know that there are. The inflationary rate was what, 15.3%, I think? Yeah. yeah. So we won't know that until we actually award a contract, right? Correct. Correct. And when, when do we anticipate it? That would be this spring. Yeah. And when will we advertise? Um, this winter. This, yeah. And then we'll have to come back. 
Yeah, and that'll be Andrea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you do that, it'll be a <laughs> Maybe we can just have a really good bake sale before yeah. Come up with the rest of the money. So also, also joining us is Andrea Light, who's the uh, director of, of budget and managers from management on the county side and she's here to talk a little bit about the technical review committee process so so everyone is aware um, we have listed all the projects both the county and the school projects they have are currently being presented to the trc so they have not been ranked yet this year so this isn't about the ranking and where things fall for this year this is to talk a little bit about the process and make sure our board um, fully understands that process because we do have a joint school oh, yes. board board of supervisors meeting next week with the board of supervisors so i'm going to let andrew get started to talk to you about um, the process okay um well thank you members of the school board i appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about the technical review committee and cip planning process i always don't seem to um go after anybody talks about interest rates because i find that so fascinating and i'm sure we all are at our seat yeah. Um, so this really shows what our CIP um, improvement process, uh, what our whole process is. And um, like Mr. Palmer said, we are here in the September, October uh, TRC review meeting. We certainly have a couple um, dates coming up that are really important um, to the school board and school staff with next week being the joint school board board of supervisor meeting. We scheduled this specifically before we do the TRC presentation to the board so that the school board has the opportunity to talk to the board of supervisors prior to getting any information from the TRC. So the so this board of supervisors other than what you have requested does not have a list of all of our requests, has not had any sort of dialogue or discussion about any of those projects. Um, so it is really a fresh start with every CIP process that you're able to um, have that opportunity to speak with them. Um, and then in December, we have a joint school board board of supervisors meeting, and that is where we um, provide to the school board and the board of supervisors the TRC recommendation and listing a ranking of all of the projects. We will have presented that once to the Board of Supervisors in November, but this is also a second opportunity for the school board to come back to the Board of Supervisors and, and, and disagree with the TRC ranking. Um, you know, maybe we put uh, an elementary school in front of a middle school, I'm pulling out projects out of my head, um, and, this, and the school board has real reason that you know, we got that wrong. And we need to really look at this in, in a, a different way. And yeah. that is the school board's real opportunity yeah. to um, to say, to ask that the board of supervisors look at that in a different way. Um, we do have the final input that we ask for the board as we're preparing the budgets in the January, February time. Um, we do have then proposed um, CIP in March in March and April, we have work sessions both on the capital improvement program individually and then the joint school board for supervisors meeting, which is again um, an opportunity for the boards to speak. And that ARP is supposed to be April. I don't know what ARP is. Um, and, um, we have the public hearings and the final CIP adoption. Yeah. So the TRC is, um, this is really provided in policy, which I think is attached to your agenda materials today. Uh, this is approved by the Board of Supervisors. It was last approved this last uh, September, I believe. And the TRC, what we're doing right now is looking at each one of those projects. We're looking at the cost of them, how you come up with those costs, um, why you need them, what's the documentation for them. Um, the schools have a considerable number of facility condition um, reports, and we have the opportunity then um, to read all of those. Um, and and lucky. <laughs> we, we are very fortunate. Um, so we get to read and go all through that. And what our members really do, what we've been doing over the past few weeks, is in September they have gotten all of the documentation, all of the members of the TRC, so that they can start getting into this. 
we meet with each of those departments as a, uh, as a group. Um, since last year, based on some um, advice from Dr. Chase, actually, we had started going to some of those localities last year. Um, this year, we have had the opportunity so far to go to two different school sites. We've been to Perry Melchers and we've been to North Stafford. And I think we're going somewhere else on Thursday, but I don't remember where. Um, and so um, that is the opportunity for that department or the schools, whoever it is, to talk about what those projects are. All of those people, um, all of the people that are going to present their projects, they have all of the information, like the capital improvement plan policy, so they know we are looking for very specific things and how we rank them. Um, we do have our members, myself, I'm the chair. We have um, a member of our, our director of Department of Capital Projects in the County Director of Planning and Zoning. Um, typically is the Executive Director of Facilities and Maintenance for Stafford County Public Schools. Um, this year uh, we have, we're lucky to have Mr. White. And um, we have a, mem a member from Public Safety. And then the, uh, the County Administrator may designate up to two personnel, each CIP. So we have one additional member. Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, what percentage of the projects um, that the TRC reviews are school projects versus county projects? Uh, typically, not this year, but in the past, um, our CIP has been made up of just over 50% is uh, school projects. Okay, but one only one representative from the schools. Um, is the school's representative allowed to rate county projects? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, um, so when Mr. Anderson, um, your last executive director of facilities, um, he was um, such a wonderful person. He actually went, um, drove all the roads. Um, he went to fire stations and he looked at them. He, I mean, he really did his due diligence about looking at those county projects. Now, I will say when, uh, when I answered the superintendent's question, we do look at large projects together. The schools do their own 3R projects. Mm -hmm. The county do their own 3R projects. And it's because it's laborious. There is, there is a significant amount of effort that goes into all of those 3R projects, which Mr. Fong will probably tell you just from his side how, how difficult that is. And, and getting to a base of understanding may be rather difficult. <clears throat> So the two personnel um, that the county administrator can designate, can one of them be a school side Absolutely. person? Okay. Were they this year? They were not. We had one additional person. Um, in, it's Brian Southall, who is the director of Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities. And we do like to keep the, the one or two. We've never had two additional personnel. I will say, um, but when we do have that, we like to rotate that among, um, at least on the county side from different departments so that we always have a fresh perspective. Maybe it might be a good idea to always have one extra school personnel person. Since you always you usually don't do two, but you can do two, stick some of Yeah, I, I think there. that's an excellent idea. And we can yeah, um, I would love certainly you could bring that up as introduce that into um, next year's process. Like, I um, think the schools would deserve just a little bit more consideration from some people who happen to be the experts on the schools. And we're 50% of the projects. Did, yeah. did we not have a MOU in the past that, that was, I, I thought we had more than one person from the school on that. We had two mm -hmm. school people and, and, and they actually had rankings. And it, was, it was kind of detailed. I mean, they um, go back a while, but prior, prior, prior to this one. I think the last time we had a joint CIP process um, was uh, about 2008, when the board and the school board had three members of each board that sat as the TRC kind of oversight committee. Um, and then it was school board and board of supervisor members. Now I will say when um, these these members that are, are dedicated on here have specific expertise um, that help with the process, like um, the director of planning and zoning brings a lot of information about um, what our cost plan is, um, what is coming up in uh, different areas. Um, so. I think it, it looks at many different levels of expertise. Now, I'm, I'm not questioning this. I just thought, and we've had turnover on our staff since then, but I, I recall 
when we first started this process of working together with the, the school board and the board of supervisors we had a very specific agreement and i think we both signed off on it um and, and there were you know, different levels and it, it was like this but they actually got into the rankings because we said you know how many points would be given to different um elements on on the projects it's, it, it probably goes back a year i imagine it might be before 2018 i don't know if we can you know check but uh, uh, respond to your question there there was more than one person from the, the schools on there so this is this policy was adopted by the, the board of supervisors in 2019 is that um and essentially there have been some small tweaks to it since then yes but, but that, on the back of that policy, the last page would have listed, I hope, um, any uh, that's any revisions, dates, and that's the the new schools policy. Not the CFP. Oh, where's the CFP? Um, it yeah, is the, this one. Yeah, the okay. much larger document. So at the back, the last page. Oh, this is 2021. All of the revision dates should be listed, and I believe we also listed when the school board adopted their uh joint portion and that was probably it and that's what I, i'm just curious as to how we went from a joint to a almost sole source yeah it's still joint you just might have lost a member on part of the joint process well, so and our member does rank the projects when i say joint i mean in putting the policy together. oh yeah, yeah. the policy then the changes the policy was worked on between the school board and the board of supervisors really with staff i'm sure you know did, did the bulk of the work but then you know there was an agreement between the two boards and then somehow that went out the window and now we have a new one so. i um so these project ranking criteria how are those percentages set and how do they like how often are they yeah um, the ranking is based on the development policy that the board sets. Um, they look at them um, every other year. We usually take our, try to update our policies every two years. Last year, they did look at these rankings. They only changed the three R rankings for, again, that relates only to the county side that does not relate to the school side. And so I haven't presented them here, um, but these are the most current rankings. So health and safety is 20% impact on operational budget is 20 percent special considerations regulatory compliance um so if we have something that's mandated um, we would get some extra. Well, that's really but it doesn't get extra and that i feel and this is just me i feel like that disproportionately impacts the schools because we are required by law to educate every student who resides in this in this county whether they show up yesterday today tomorrow we are required by law to have a certain number of students in classrooms, um, whether it's six or 36. And we are constrained by the buildings we have. And we are going to be dinged there because, you know, you think health and safety, all of these, you know, fire and rescue, which are essential, especially for our kids. But we're getting told to put our kids in trailers because 5%. So because we have to and then that comes out of our budget it doesn't come out of the infrastructure budget because we don't know i mean we have lionel we get really really darn close but like if we can't if that's not regulatory compliance and health and safety are like the two most important things we do and if they're not even on the same like Percentage. measurement then that impacts the schools tremendously and and just as an example you've got uh, th not you, they have a fire and rescue joint training center before elementary school 18 based on just their ranking criteria now, which is why I put all this out. So there's that's kind of flawed to me when you start to look at your health and safety criteria is flood control when a lot of the health and safety impacts of our kids as the overcrowding in schools. And so that's not listed in here and the understanding of what those things do and what the schools actually need. So that's just a concern for me. But then, and I get that these are all all county projects all county projects and all pots of money and all sorts of stuff but if the ranking system is flawed then we're going to be constantly well, we're so like we're automatically 20 percent of the score right. behind but i right. think that needs right. to be a discussion that we have at the board of you yeah, know i agree i agree i'm just trying to give an example of what she's talking about making, making 
I mean, we don't need a joint training center before we need another school. And that's what this says priority wise. So, I mean, this is, I mean, everything before. I mean, our highest school, school I, is 49. A question. So, right. Um, I, I'm just noticing in here. So, we have, uh, we, we off, often argue about design capacity versus program capacity, specifically at the elementary schools. And I notice in here that it says the Board of Supervisors will only recognize nice changes to design capacity, which are voted on and approved by the school board. So do we just need to have some votes to get the design capacity changed for our schools? Is that how we make it happen? Because that. that's, 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 that's what your document what, says. What page is on? I'm on, uh, I don't, there aren't page numbers. So um, I'm Let's, under existing school capacity. Dated June school. School. I think it's under the new school uh, planning policy. It is right. in the new school planning policy. <clears throat> and um, Dr. Chase, um, so the Board of Supervisors does not look at program capacity in elementary schools. Sure. The comprehensive plan also, um, so it was so recommended by the planning so commission to use a, program capacity, yeah. and the Board of Supervisors voted to have that amended to um, design capacity. Oops. Um, so those those changes that the board, the school board may vote on would be changes to the design of the school. So if you're adding another wing to a school and you're adding four more classrooms, those classrooms hold um, X number of children. Sure, but it just says we can vote to, to change design capacity. I don't see why we can't vote. Right. I mean, if, if I'm using four classrooms for special ed, I'm going to have to redesign those four rooms, and I could put them all together and call and it a wing. That's actually regulation. How many students we are allowed to have in a special education classroom? Right. right now, we're not even in compliance with that because we don't have the space. Right. So, at any rate, I, I would suggest that we may want to have some votes you about. Want to have some votes on this? Yeah. Well, also, just and I mean, and you know, we're not picking on you, right? Like this is just like as I'm reading this, this it's infrastructure. This is fine. <laughs> yeah. um, but it says, is there a facility being replaced that has exceeded its use for life, and to what extent? Like for the schools, if that's your criteria, then that's 100% of this, and that brings us right up to 75 points. So it's just it's interesting to me to see the perception of the criteria. Um, from each side of the fence, because it's very different. And even the quality of life, your quality of life criteria, I mean, for some of these kids, and for some of yeah, the, so can, the so stuff that we're putting in place, trying to put in place for them and giving them access to, okay. like, so, it's it's a big deal. It's a, it's a big deal. So, I agree. Vote. I think we can finish this presentation. I just have <laughs> Oh. I like or words. I ask. like words, Nathan. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go operational way. cost reduction. I don't want to go yeah. backwards. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. right. absolutely. Um, so for this me, is so um, just for your information. This is a list of all of our large projects that have been requested <laughs> this year. Um, Parks and Rec, uh, judicial, of course. There's the courthouse, the schools. Uh, One point four billion. Um, of course, this doesn't include your three R, share of transportation and a fire and rescue. So there's a significant amount of projects that the board of supervisors will look at and consider how they uh, how they adopt these in their, in their capital program. But do I mean do they understand that ignoring our projects doesn't make them go away? Like the kids are coming and they will need rooms and teachers and books and computers and we the kids, will need space. The kids already came. They, they well, <laughs> well, I just mean like for the long term plan. Like, mm -hmm. just saying you're not going to fund a school doesn't mean we're not going to need a school. But they can answer that, right? But that's, like, I think this is a conversation for the yeah. joint next session. Week, yeah. Not next for, Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Let's not pick on Andrew. Could you go for the third years and just get that out of the way for us? Like, <laughs> when we get there, we all have My to life to do. My life would be yeah. so much easier. Uh, we can just do that. Um, yeah. But if you don't mind, I'd like to, if you'd indulge me for a few more minutes about proffers, we do, um, there's often questions about proffers and it really kind of comes into the CIP process. 
Um, each spring, our planning and development department begins with a review, a comprehensive review of all of our proffers um, and projection of when new proffers may be received over a five-year period. Um, the county finance department updates our June 30th year-end collection. So we have projections, we have a good um, cutoff year-end. And then late summer, early fall, um, uh, actually two weeks ago or last week, I believe, all departments, including the schools, sit down and we review those proffers available and what's projected. And we look at those proffers compared to what is in our CIP, how we might be able to fit those in. Now, proffers don't change significantly from year to year. Um, so we feel like this is still a good process to look at, um, to look back at, to look forward with, and we can consider what proffers we may have available and we might be able to use this. This year we um, did a little bit extra in this proper meeting as we started to um, discuss some synergies that we may have. There's a lot of needs um, throughout the county and the schools that kind of overlap and how, how can we come together as staff and make continued recommendations to those projects um, through this proper discussion or through our CIP that may, may get us into a better spot. So what if we co-located a fleet services building and a joint training center? What does that look like? And so we're trying to continue to work together to do that. Um, this here is a list of school proffers. This is a cutout um, from the budget, the fiscal year 2023 uh, budget book um, and where we're projected to use those. So our current actuals is what we had on June 30th of 2021. Again, this is a year behind. Um, our future years is what's projected, what's programmed in the CIP, and then uh, what's available for projects. And you can find the county CIP um, on our website, and also the proffer list is also on our can website. You, can you put that proffer uh, spreadsheet back up? Yes. So um, elementary school 18, they're using all sort of proffers in Garrisonville. Mm -hmm. um, if elementary school 18 is in the southern end of the county, would the proffers then come potentially from the Hartwood Rocky Run Westlake, or is that all already spent on high school yeah. six? Um, so we we would probably have to make adjustments. I mean, we, we try to do this in projections of where we think maybe this is gonna maybe end up um, and, and things change and we have to make adjustments. So okay. we have to pull back some proffers and then we have to add maybe some more bond funding, maybe some more um, year end fund balance. Um, so we make those adjustments. Right, so, I mean, okay. so if elementary Absolutely. school 18 is in the Southern end of the county, we can't use Northern proffers for it, right? It has right. to it, it, provide it, relief specifically for that area. Yes, right. and okay. Dr. Jason, each proffer is different. It has its own restrictions and limitations. Sure. So there are a lot of fun for planning and zoning to go through and try <laughs> to, you know, what the, what this can go to this and can go to this. Right, so thank you. But generally, yes. Yeah. Traditionally, we've been told that the proffers have to go to the a school where the subdivision feeds into, whether it's the elementary, middle, or, or high. Is that not the case anymore? It depends on the proffer stipulations. Each one is different. So uh, am I correct in assuming then that since we've got five different <coughs> districts that are all earmarked for elementary 18, there are no restrictions on those proffers? Um, I would have to look at those specifically, but that's what we have programmed in at this time. Um, again, we make adjustments every CIP um, cycle. We try to make this better. We try to make improvements and to use them to the broadest extent of, available. So as an example, um, you've got one for Rock Hill uh, that, that doesn't seem like it might fit given uh, a potential elementary school, forget the number, in that zone. However, it may have a peripheral impact on the project because it relieves <coughs> pressure in that community, and that may be tied to the, to the problem. It depends on what's written in it, but that that is that is not irregular to have a proffer written in a way that a new school would benefit another school that's servicing the area. Right. But some of these proffers will probably go back okay. yeah. decades. Oh, sure. Some okay. of these developments were approved in, you know, in the nineties. So I'm curious about that as to what flexibility there is in using the proffers. 
you know, separate projects. And whose decision was that, that they would all go to elementary school 18? Um, when we look at this as a group, we try to see uh, which project that is going to benefit to begin with, that's already in the CIP or the CIP request. And that's how we assign them. The county attorney or county a deputy county attorney is available as we go through these. So we are kind of talking about these, um, not as theoretically as maybe I'm making it sound, but, um, and then planning and zoning helps to guide that. So is, is the we include schools? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, it would. And, and in fairness to the county folks, they're also operating off of a CIP document that at the time when it was passed, it did identify elementary school 18 in the specific geographic zone, but that was 365 days ago. So, you know, in fairness to them, they're, they're operating off of a document that the board has revisited a couple of times since then. So elementary school 18 is not the heart of rebuild. Correct. Is that correct? That is correct. That was from last year's so. quick, easy question. Is there a way when we change a document that they may look at in the future? This might be a silly question, but how do we get it to them so that they can have what we have? Yeah, so at, at your last monthly board meeting, you adopted a, a capital improvement plan, and um, that week we forwarded that document okay, so to the county. Okay. But in fairness they, to them, this is week they, three of their possession of that document, or week four of it. So they're, they're processing it as a part of this process, just like we all are a part of this as well. And so as the board has reprioritized its projects, they now have to do the work of, and, and so does the TRC, in aligning proffers to go with the projects that the board has reprioritized. So what about the proffers that are going to be used for the turf fields we just put in, or were they not going to be proffers? Um, those proffers, so this document came from um, the, 20, uh, the 23 CIP, which I do not believe was adopted. The, the turf fields weren't adopted on the day that the board adopted this, or they were adopted on the day, um, because it was late April, early May. And so this is a point in time. This is a picture in time of what we had in coffers. It's already out of date. Yeah. Already yeah. Very yeah. much out of date already. This isn't, a, this isn't as of today by any means. No. This, yeah. if anything, this was the last the adopted C county CIP yeah. and how the proffers were allocated. Okay. So I'm just curious as to where the proffers are coming from that are going to pay back for the, the turf fields. Do we have that information or when that was approved? Were they specified? Uh, we can get it. We, yeah, so I mean, it was specified. In it was definitely resolution. specified. And I don't want to misspeak. Yeah. I, I, so, so now that I know this is not accurate, then that makes more sense. Well, I would say that it was accurate at a point well, in time. But today, and as yeah. soon as you, not, yeah, as soon as as you put today. your budget out, the next day it's, right. it's but, changed. But it's, it's, it's no longer <laughs> accurate. If I look at this, so, all the proffers are not going to go to elementary school 18 as of today's document, as of tomorrow's right. document, it might be. Right, yeah. okay. yes, so um, we're fluid in our process, um, but this you can find on the CIP. So at least you have a list of all those proffers. And I hope that you have a good feeling that there is a school and county process that we look at those together. We do look at those closely. So when do you say that the supervisors will look at their language? You said that they changed some of their 3R language, but they didn't change necessarily the, um, the process of how projects are ranked. They didn't change any of that language. But you said they do it every two years? Is Typically, that right? we try to bring the policies updates um, every two years. OK, so this will come up next year next then? Next year. Mm -hmm. In At what time of year? Um, if my planning goes well, uh, I would like to have it done, you know, May, June, July, so okay. that we have a set document so that when departments uh, are developing when you start turning your process. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, I saved the, the, the slide you guys presented when you were discussing the funding. Um, and again, I don't know that this is 100% what was officially decided on, but the conversation was around um, 400,000 from Wits and Woods a million dollars from Winding Creek Proffers for the North Stafford Field, um, 939000 from the Liberty Knowles West Proffers, and about 500000 from Westgate Proffers for the Colonial Forge Fields. And we are allowed to use Proffers for fields? Apparently. 
We just did. We had expanded the use of that field um, because it just expanded the time. Uh, well, this is what I read. I didn't know. Yes, so yes, yes. Like, yes. Okay. Thank you. And you know, the subtext says that they had been previously earmarked for elementary night or I'm sorry, 18, and then were essentially being pulled forward um, to use for this. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. We'll yeah. see you next week, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Accreditation. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I know we are a little bit tight on time this evening, so I am going to go over this fairly quickly and then we can, you know, determine a process for additional um, follow up questions or research needed um, based on how we go through that. So uh, as you all know, um, this is the first year we've had accreditation uh, since the um, pandemic. Um, so the good news is that all of our schools are fully accredited by the Virginia Department of Education. Um, the um, <laughs> well, the news is... we all have all of our schools have room for improvement, uh, right? Um, so no matter how high they are, obviously the majority, but some of us have room, additional room for improvement. Um, okay. And then we're going to get into some of the strategies we're using to support schools that are needing some additional assistance right now, and then just a little bit to go over some of the changes that have been made with accreditation. Um, so starting with that last one first, the last year we had accreditation in the division, um, was also the first year of a newly adopted accreditation process in mm -hmm. the state. And then they have also been making shifts throughout the pandemic to move towards the SOL growth assessments, et cetera. Um, so there is, you know, I brought with me here the, a 30 some page booklet that goes over the nuts and bolts of how school accreditation is calculated. It's not a super simple process. It, it factors in a lot of different pieces. Um, partially because figuring out how kids are doing is complicated, right? Um, so there's a number of different factors that go into that. Um, speaking about the good news, right? So all of our schools are fully accredited um, coming out of the pandemic. And then the vast majority, I know this is small on this screen, but the vast majority of our schools are continuing to um, show gains and, you know, um, <coughs> Encouraging to look at the last couple of years and see that um, we're continuing to um, come up. So, 13 of our 17 elementary schools, um, kind of nothing was flagged whatsoever by the state. Four of our five high schools, nothing was flagged whatsoever. Okay. Um, there are a number of schools that have level two concerns. And one of the things I want to point out here is that we've got two different ways we categorize this. So, um, on our level two quality indicators, these schools are highlighted because there was a, um, a gap between performance between different reporting groups, right? So the overarching achievement may have been in the green, but then when you um, went into different reporting categories, there was too significant of a gap. And I will tell you for our middle schools, it is all related. Um, not all related. Our worst category there is our um, our students with disabilities across all of those schools right now is in the red area. Okay. Um, this is an area where the state allows us to focus on division monitoring internally so that we can figure out what we need to do. We've got plans. Um, our school leadership team can certainly speak mm -hmm. to that to the work they are actively doing to work with those schools. As a quick question, do our students with disabilities, since that seems to impact that gap, do we have schools with a higher percentage of students with disabilities than other schools? We do. Um, and I would say, I would say division-wide, we're about 13.5% students with disabilities. And uh, we have some schools that are in the high teens, and then we have some schools that are 10 11%. So. There are there are there are very thirteen is about the national average. Is yeah, it is, yeah. and we're on par with that. Oh, that's um, yeah, no, it's, it's about. Yeah. 
All right, then the second piece here is our schools with level two academic achievement indicators, which means overarching performance across all students is below where we would like it to be, right? So we're not at a level three, but we're not at the level one that we wanna be, and this is um, across that. So um, Drew fit into that category, Park Ridge Elementary and Stafford <coughs> Middle. Um, I believe the level two, I'd have to refresh, but I believe this was science was the area. Yeah, science um, seems to be an area in all of our schools. But then um, <clears throat> for the two middle schools, there were also some of the, um, the gap pieces, okay? Um, so one of the things that's interesting, and I will be interesting to see where our scores go this year, but um, the eighth grade science SOL, as many of you are probably familiar, covers three years of science, right? Um, so our kids that took that last year had the majority of their middle school experience through virtual and different platforms. Um, and then level three concerns, um, you are um, looking at significant, so this is quality indicators, so you're looking at a um, significant levels of gaps there and overarching performance, and there we have um, Again, the science across all of those elementary schools and then mathematics um, for separate senior. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, no, oh, thank you. Um, so here are some of the themes kind of I've seen as and we've been seeing as we've been going through this. Um, definitely some need for holistic support with science instruction and prioritization at the elementary and middle school levels. Um, so we've maybe erred slightly on the side of really trying to make sure that our literacy and mathematics skills weren't um, going unattended during the pandemic. Um, and we've definitely seen that science has suffered because of that. So. Well, science, I mean, in, having taught it too, but science is something that you can introduce a topic, but the hands-on piece of it is crucial to the understanding of it. And without the kids being there, it wasn't the hands-on piece that would have helped them. Um, and then need for holistic literacy support at the secondary level, as I highlighted, um, that was kind of our big gap area in all of our middle schools um, was in the literacy area. Um, and is that the ESOL or is that just across the board literacy? Um, there were, it depended on the school, which the gaps were, um, the students with disabilities was pretty much read across all of them. And then you saw definitely some level twos with economically disadvantaged students, some schools, um, EL students, some schools, different um, minority ethnic groups. So it just, it really did depend on the school um, in terms of the combination of those factors. Um, we, we all know we're facing um, critical mathematics teacher shortages. Um, we've definitely seen that impact at the secondary level. Um, and then, you know, the need for continuing to support. We have a number of schools that had um, high levels of absenteeism this year. While we know some of that was related to kind of quarantines and we expect that to improve, there's also um, the need to really make sure we're supporting kids with um, them being in the building. Um, and then, as, as we've already mentioned, kind of the performance of students with disabilities and English learners. So the attendance, um, we're, we were well below the state average. Was the state average not also having to deal with quarantines and such? My, <laughs> no, 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 I, I've kind of debated this internally myself, so it may partially have to do with um, how much did, you know, certain localities record absenteeism if they, were, you know what I mean? Like that could have been a really nuanced category in the last couple of years where maybe if the kid was still attending remotely, they were counting them as present, you know what I mean? So it, um, my hunch is you maybe had across different localities, different, <laughs> Okay. I could be wrong on that, but yeah. for counting, counting absenteeism differently. Well, but I'm fascinated it. that the state would have a metric, but they aren't specifying how they want it measured. Well, and, and candidly, there there was not tight regulation over how that looks and boots on the ground. A lot of this is dependent on how it is reported, not how it is collected. Mm -hmm. And that there isn't an auditing mechanism with less than 200 people who work in the Virginia Department <coughs> of Education to supervise 
uh, 130 school systems. And so that's where you might get some of the variance. I had a conversation with a, a superintendent uh, today who asked about our attendance practices because his neighboring attendance, uh, his neighboring school district, he was trying to check to see how they were doing because they were still granting extended COVID leave for students and marking them present, which is not accurate and not what you should do. And he was he was questioning whether whether that was a practice that he was unaware of or that that was something that should be continued and that it being missed a memo. Um, so are there other metrics that are wishy-washy like that that we should be aware of? Um, well, the, the, a lot of the metrics that are collected, um, discipline is, is one of those that is definitely, we are reporting the discipline data, but the other metrics that are being collected as it relates to accreditation are all collected by the state. Okay. So the, the two that, that we don't are the environmental ones tied to um, discipline and attendance. Am I the only one that thinks that attendance and mental health go together though, right? Like, if depends you're, on how yeah, you're, we, we group right? them together because they do go together. Yeah, and, but it depends you know, on how you're, like if you have a met, like a consistent metric across the state and how you're collecting that data. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's Okay, so some of the different um, areas we're striving to improve. Um, we, this summer, had a rollout of the new school improvement planning process really focused on um, improvement science and the Plan Do Study Act process. Um, school improvement plans are currently in the process of being revised to include specific targeted strategies, right? So we don't have the full accreditation data until um, school already starts. Um, so. As additional data has come out, schools have um, been adjusting and adding additional areas and wraparound supports. Um, so this just highlights some of the different ways we're trying to think through the way we report and utilize data to support as we are going through the year process. Um, our instructional leadership team has been collaborating very closely with the BDOE Office of School Quality. A number of us have been attending webinars, going to on-site training in Virginia Beach, um, et cetera, with um, administrators from the buildings that are really focused on improvement to um, do some really deep digging. Um, also looking at kind of getting back to and refining some instructional learning walkthroughs to really help us um, increase the rigor of our tier one instructional strategies. Um, streamlining access to curricular resources is in the area academic programs is working on. Um, they're also um, working with school leadership on out of school time programming to support and reinforce content areas. We do have some grant funds to support that work right now. So they're really trying to be strategic about how to leverage that particular at the elementary school level and middle school level with um, some of our areas. And then um, intentional um, professional learning to support with effective tier one and differentiation strategies. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, continuing to focus on those targeted areas at each school with your school leadership team. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. what, what's the response been of the schools, you know, looking at what needs to be, you know, focused on and, and, and have they asked for additional resources? Are they able to do it with what they have? Or, you know, what can we do to help the schools so I, get I where they need to be? I am going to send that one over to the school leadership team because I think they would be best able to answer that question. I know Rodney had a school improvement plan meeting for parents and, you know, a handful of us showed up um, and listened to that and they outlined like what they're, you know, where, explained this to us and you know, parent understanding terms and what that means and how they're going to address it at the school level. Yeah, um, I don't know how that translates to what they are asking us for here, but they seem to have a plan, be on top of it, know where, you know, essentially they screwed up, like what needs to be redirected to reach their goals. They seem pretty confident of us. I'm really Wide glad Water. you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, Widewater did as well, and they went yeah. to Virginia Beach for training, and they brought in Mike Pratt to help with their science curriculum, and they've become more intentional about it. I think they were so mm -hmm. focused on math and reading skills that science kind of got lost in the shuffle, but they are 
refocusing that energy on it, but I know that they also had a meeting with parents to explain what their strategy was. So uh, the, probably the most significant change from last year to this year in terms of focusing on, on continuous improvement is having a continuous improvement plan for every single school. Um, two of the components that are a little different than anything that our folks have experienced other than going through a full 45-day plan do study act process, they're already in their second cycle. Very exciting uh, that they've completed mm -hmm. one cycle. They're already on to the next cycle. Coincidentally, they coincide with nine week marking periods um, is that they actually have to have community meetings that are quarterly with the community to discuss their school improvement plan and also post their plans on their website. So, you know, we want to be very transparent with what the schools are working on specifically. Um, the, the thing that this slide doesn't really capture is how each plan is nuanced to the school's specific needs. And though these are the, the general um, themes that Rebecca and the school leadership team have pulled out, um, that they, they are very specific to the targeted needs and goals of the individual schools. And that's probably our, our biggest crowning achievement coming out of the summer in terms of looking at continuous improvement. So, so do we have resources that are available should the schools Absolutely, yes. and on November 7th, it's our professional development day, and those schools are involved with, um, along with Mike Pratt, providing intensive training in the area of science for elementary. So, <coughs> I can't imagine three years getting tested on three years, two of which were remote. And and especially the because um, just, the way we offer science some of the kids like took it mid-year and some of the kids had to wait to the end of the year because they put all the kids in science for one half the year and then yeah whatever the other social, class, studies. social studies for the other half the year it wasn't like a normal normal schedule um but they were, we did the best we could so are we going to know any kind of, i know since they've um enacted sols more than once in a year is any of that going to help us in driving some of what you guys are planning for improving in these schools? So one of the things we've done with the moving to the growth is sent out to each school a student detail by question report, which lets schools see, okay, how did it breaks it? It's all aligned to the SOL standards right, right. and then substandards, so they can see how do kids do at the beginning of the year, which they're not going to do very well because it's on last year. It was a com combination of the previous year, like third graders were covering second grade standards as well as third. So this year it was strictly third grade standards kind of thing. Um, and then, so so you'll have some kids that already know the a few things, but most of it you'll start to see by the mid-year data, you know, are we seeing some gains there and then those pieces. Um, Long-term goals would then be to start to longitudinally align that so that you get that by the beginning of the next year, your fourth grade teacher has, okay, what did that look like for third grade? Okay. So when is the mid-year data available? We should have that uh, in January. Let's time it. Yep. Okay. Madam Chair, the next one should be a quick one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Towery. Um, uh, and uh, lots of compliments to the FABC for giving some feedback on how we might tighten up uh, proposed budget priorities for the board's consideration for the fiscal 24 budget. We landed on three uh, budget priorities that came out of FABC, and I gotta give credit to FABC for this really important recommendation, which was how to establish the rationale behind the request. And so we think we landed in the right spot um, with these. Uh, the first one focuses on having a high quality teacher in every classroom and how we might um, approach that through compensation and benefits. Um, and, uh, and making sure that we're competitive, not just on our teacher scale, but for our entire workforce. Uh, the second one is very much focused on uh, providing supports uh, in our uh, trouble areas for subjects, but also looking at uh, staffing and making sure that, that we're meeting our school needs in terms of, uh, in 
terms of the uh, um, support staff that are in place. And the third one has to do with um, our learning environment and making sure that we have uh, the high quality things that we need uh, to, to accommodate for our growth and, uh, and also to make sure that our, our spaces are safe and have uh, um, adequate space for students to learn. I just wanna say, I think these are much better. They have did a good job. Um, I just have a couple little complaints. No. <laughs> Not really complaints. <laughs> um, I, I just think, um, I think they're really good. The only thing I really um, didn't like is in number two, to reverse our adverse performance trajectory, I think I would rather have to focus on a more positive outcome instead of the negative outcome. And then in the last one, we have a CIP for our capital needs, and this is an operational budget. So I would just prefer if we truncated part of this and just said our needs for space and resources and just kept it a little simpler. But that's just my opinion. And, and, and can I say uh, for, for the first one, um, it says one strategy, but it doesn't say we want to do it. So I would just get rid of that and have it read to attract and retain high quality teachers and staff. We must establish and maintain competitive salaries and benefits, right? Okay, we, we will need to edit this in the yeah. next half hour because this yeah. is going before no, you yeah. so, yeah. um, so we're just going to make sure. Kristen and I just, I and just, and my thought was just um, teachers and administration critical to, um, to ensure student success. Just keep it simple or student achievement. All right, so let's go one by one. Edits to uh, section one yes. that you want to see. Right, so what I would say is get rid of one strategy and just change it to, to attract and retain high quality teachers and staff. We must establish and maintain competitive salaries and benefits, comma, and then get rid of this strategy should include and just make it a multi-year um, uh, uh, maintain competitive salaries and benefits, including a multi-year approach to enhance teacher step scale, blah, 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 blah. Okay, okay. okay. I, I have a question right. about putting the teacher step scale there. Mm -hmm. um, we got um, into a bind mm -hmm. uh, years ago when we didn't have money to do raises and teachers, among other employees, came to the board and said, you promised me you know, when I was hired, I would I was be the getting these raises. These Maybe are the just steps. Change it to salary scale. So, yeah, I, I just would be reluctant yeah. to okay. put out there that there is not going to be a teacher step scale because we so just we change don't step know. to salary. Is that amenable? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Teacher yeah. compensation yeah. strategy. Yeah. Now, what what are you going to say? Um, so, so it's where he says a multi year approach to enhance uh, teacher compensation. Teacher compensation. Yeah. To include. Not even just that competes with surrounding schools. Well, teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Not just teachers. Okay. Well, we don't want to give away. Well, want... Can you read that? I'm, I'm just trying to get the sentence after and maintain competitive salaries and benefits. You said comma, and then I would uh, read after that. I said to and include a multi year approach to enhance teacher compensation uh, that, competes. that competes with surrounding school districts, offer regionally competitive. Uh, compensation for non-teaching positions and provide comprehensive benefits and opportunities for advancement for all um, employees. Okay, just just yep. tread cautiously on this multi-year. Yep. Because we can only commit a year. Yeah, absolutely. If everything I mean, has it, an asterisk. Yeah. Well, no, I, I just I mean, we know it when we're year. sitting here, but once we adopt right. this and publish it. Right. There is going to be an expectation that it literally, you know, it means what it says. I I don't have I agree we right. need to have the multi-year right. approach, but I don't want there to be a right. misunderstanding that we can commit for right. right multi years more than one year at a time. Right. That's right. I know there was at least one other change somebody suggested, so I just want to get that to number no. two. Number two. Number two. Um, it just, I would cross out critical to, re I would cross out oh, the yeah. reverse, our adverse performance trajectory, and just say critical to ensure student success or student achievement. And, and I would change plummeted to fallen. <laughs> plummeted just seems so like. Dramatic. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, wow. It was pretty dramatic. You lost 50 dramatic. points. Yeah, yeah. but it I would still, dramatic. I would still make it. Uh, has fallen rather than plummeted. But if we plummeted, it'll be that much better when we rise. I mean, 
we plummeted. I mean, if we did, we we've did. Plummeted. Plummeted. We've we've plummeted. Plummeted. Well, then we can say crater. Have, you know, <laughs> have, have <laughs> um, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And other areas which have fallen in recent years. I, you know, I don't think we have to. I don't think we have to exaggerate the, the depth of our our our. our home. Oh, it, we don't need to exaggerate it. It's there. And we know it's there. <laughs> um, the goal is this: is to tell you yeah. how, we, how to spend Correct. money to fix it. So, Correct. and then in the third one, the only thing I would just take out after additional space and resources, and and and, and then take out parking to. Um, the end of that sentence is and then add building because I think that's all part of it space and resources and yep. you know parking whatever because you can't enumerate everything that we might need to do so I just that's wouldn't right. I wouldn't list them that's the only thing I would change just, no. and other than that I think they're great good job thank you right. fab I appreciate it yeah. you're welcome yeah, you all, did, did a nice job. <clears throat> all right madam chair um, we, there's one more item can, for the... can we just make sure we are all know what's coming back so we won't have any sure. questions if, if we okay. could just just read those three changes with what you've got so yep. okay. we're all on yep. you know, in sync and then when we come back it just that's what we wanted yeah. we're not voting you know, in here but some of the verbiage might act, might tweak it as i go or when no, we, we need to yeah well i'm just what, what you give us now and is stuff what as i read this i might have we're going to gonna correct, expect but. to see when it comes up for a vote sure. Sure. and we'll get the corrected one before the board meeting so uh, in number one, changing the sentence to say, to attract and retain high quality teachers and staff, we must establish and maintain competitive salaries and benefits, comma, including a multi-year approach to enhance a teacher compensation, to enhance teacher compensation that competes with surrounding school districts. And then the rest of the number one, all good there. Yeah. And number two, we're changing plummeted to fallen. Uh, in the second or third sentence, it says additional staffing for psychs, social workers, counselors, special education teachers, ESOL teachers, administrators is critical to student achievement, period. Correct? To ensure, yes. to ensure student achievement. Okay, let me go back to this first line. Has school attendance plummeted or is just the performance yes. and the literacy? And Both. the other, they, so, so attendance has plummeted? Well, we did see that in the. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Because it depends. It depends on on, on how you measure, measure it. We measured it that it that it was um, chronic absenteeism in some of our schools based on the state standards. But it may have been quarantining that resulted yeah, or, in that, or not. Yeah, other right, people yeah. not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if students aren't there, they aren't learning. So so let's. So I, I think the attendance really needs to be there. And then so. the number three, the third to last line, will say drive the determination of needs for additional space and resources. Period. Yes. So then and then, should be maintained. Yeah. Should we say in recent COVID years? No. no. I mean, that really isn't. Is it the COVID years or is it beyond the COVID years that it's? I think beyond the COVID think years, we, you've had a you've had a slow. We trip. started yeah, to see. Started we started to see a decline three, before well, the COVID every year. year. No, but 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 if you've been working for five years, that's a big. Okay. It's okay. Now it's falling. So we went from a drip to a plummet. Well, I just want to say so. But I think COVID might have contributed. So let's average it. I was so falling. Yes. The average of drip and plummet is falling. A drip isn't a plummet. Okay. It feels like a plummet this year. Madam Chair. It's a fallen. It's a fallen. Um yes, you may want to grab a sandwich. Yeah, why don't we get our food and then come 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 back here and and go into the um VSPA because VSPA let's take five minutes, we'll come back at six ten. We'll go till six twenty. Oh, I'm old, freaky, yeah. and yeah. So, Maureen and or Miss Sigmund and Miss Randall were the people named here, but traditionally we always put this on the agenda before we go to the, the conference so that the board has a chance to talk about the VOCA 
uh, legislative agenda and if there's anything that we have comments on. I mean, it's a couple times we've had some cases where we've, you know, directed our delegate um, to vote against certain things or not to support them. Um, but this is an opportunity for the board members to raise any questions that they have about the suggested um, legislative positions and also if there, you know, if, if there are ones that there is some concern about, then we can put it on the agenda for the next meeting to take a vote. So right now it's just for purposes of, of discussing the, um, the proposed have, legislative do we have agenda. Do we have Missy to take minutes? Is, is this, is, isn't this recorded? It is it's, recorded. Is it, is it, is it, Missy will listen to, you know. Um, so in, a, in addition to that, so first of all, I want to say this kind of stuff is like my fantasy football. This is what I track, this is what I follow, this is like my day job, I love it. Um, also, I did read that in, these are only the changes to their policy platform. If we as a board go through the policy platform annually and find something in there that the sitting board does not support, we have to vote in, a, in public to oppose that position, tell them, or when they send their sign-on letter, they're going to sign us all on. And I think that happened once, I forget what it was, with the superintendent thing, where it said all the superintendents did this, and you were like, no, I didn't. Like, uh, we, they just we did a blanket approval because nobody opted out. And so um, we don't do it this way. We usually made us, the delegates only discuss these things, but you have to just request, mm -hmm. like if you're going to have want to change the language or something, you have to submit it ahead of time. It's discussed right. and then they're all voted on. Right, but the well, pl the plat that's like the, the platform the after the we've done it all different ways over the, over yeah, the years. So like after they year. vote in November, that becomes the policy platform for the mm -hmm. year. And mm -hmm. then if we are like, well, we still don't like it, then we can vote to essentially opt out of that section. Oh yeah, we do. And um, mm -hmm. and that's fine. So like as far as the BSBA is concerned, we can continue to discuss. So a lot of it I really like. One, I was really surprised and i don't know how this happens everything suggested was brought here by fairfax county that's perfect and it's that, um it's because they have the most experience and it's it's not that they did everything because almost always there's a joint conversation it's just they may be the ones that finalize the language with um was it jd kessler well the objects of that is pretty terrible it, I, so, I, like, I agree some <laughs> of these are perennials though that have been on here several years yeah then don't put i mean is it do they have to tell us who or just make it part of well, of course they work at it they um, do i was really interested in seeing the state testing and coordination support one uh, the, the english um english learners i think that's great that's pretty in line with what we talked about here yeah the testing support i've been visiting a lot of schools and one of my principals said like we love our special ed person but if i could ask for one more thing and would be a testing coordinator in particular yeah, the state ding, requires ding, ding. testing, but then provides no SOQs right. to support their administration, which is silly. So I like that. Oh, hold on, I got this wrong three times. All right, good. I, um, no, I had a note for that on that one, but I read it wrong now. I'm reading it right now that you're talking. Go ahead. So the ed tech funding one, I like funding. However, I don't know how I feel about Richmond setting what the purchasing guidelines or replacement guidelines are. Um, because I don't think there's a one size fits all best practices, counties that are more rural. I mean, I know they want us all to have internet, but I don't think, you know, everything else they talk about, it's about local control and local decision making. So having Richmond kind of add a layer of bureaucracy to make, you know, some counties feel like rock stars and some counties feel like underachievers, I think is, you know, I don't think this is a good use of our efforts. Um, I really, are you on are asking for one? funding. Oh yeah, you are. Yeah. I don't think that they should be dictating. I agree. Um, the school bus purchase, I really don't care for that one either. I don't oh, mind yeah. the whole thing about the distributor just like dealer it. thing. I think we should buy from whoever we want, but I, you know, Mr. Fulmer has told us how financially essentially yes. irresponsible it is to have school yes. buses mm -hmm. and the divisions that can afford school buses don't need support to purchase school buses those of us who are waiting 100 years to get school buses need help um, yes, and that if we're going to help for transportation it should not go so that you know other counties can spend millions on buses 
that the rest of us. I also do. I like don't the want assistance on electric get. buses yeah. because mm -hmm. yeah. some saying. counties they're not going to be viable. They're not no. going to be viable here. They're not viable here, no. unfortunately. And, if, and we're a big the division. And so we <laughs> yeah. would lose. Uh, so I don't think there should be something that the state dictates because I think it fails to take into consideration where you individual are. individual counties. I, I agree. Well, and not only that, it, I mean, it, the state is going to do what it wants. Let's face it. But as a school board yeah, organization, but we're asking for this, so yeah. But that's the thing. It's like if it's not for the benefit. I mean, if it's not to our benefit, then there are probably divisions much, much smaller than us that are right. also not going to benefit. Like I feel like we're kind of like the threshold between big schools and small schools and. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, but we're Alaska or something. You have this incredible attendance zone, mm -hmm. right. yeah. and you're not going to be able to use electric buses no. to get the kids from there all the way over here. Right. Yeah. So, didn't like that one. It might work in Garrisonville. <laughs> yeah. Small. Yeah. 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 I think Garrisonville should just be completely a walk zone. No buses in Garrisonville at all. Just kidding. But, but um, no cars either. Yeah. Just. All gated. Um, standards of quality and accreditation was a little confusing to me. I would. I did. Which one is that? The nine one. It seems like even when I go down to. Um, you know, it makes advocacy more general and highlights potential local fiscal impacts of changes to either. I mean, it doesn't really say anything, so like, why bother? This is editorial. Okay. Yeah, and that's um, a waste of energy for the BSB to bother with that. Proposed by Fairfax County. Sorry. So safe school environment, what does it mean? Oppose legislation, and this is like too many words that seem to cancel each other out. Oppose legislation requiring the designation of school personnel to carry concealed weapons in schools. So what they're saying is, is that they're fine with law enforcement carrying a firearm. But they don't want um, legislation to require that school personnel be identified. So they don't want school Virginia. They don't want Richmond requiring us to arm our staff. They want okay. Again, it was one of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it doesn't prevent us from doing it either. If I mean, no. I'm not saying I would. I'm just saying they talk about local right. control, and every division should have. I think what they're trying to say is they don't want Virginia telling us that we have right. to. Right, and that's what I was trying, that's how I read it, but I wasn't 100% sure. Um, Thank you. I don't really think this is in line with their policy platform. Um, <laughs> children with disabilities, I'm fully funding the IDEA. So th this is actually a pretty big deal um, yeah. because uh, right now, and this is no mystery, IDEA is a federal program, but yet we're measured on performance of students with disabilities, even though no real direct funding is committed in a meaningful way to students with disabilities at the state level because it's a federal program. I know like Senator Payne has talked about, has been trying to get some, you know, nobody's talking about funding 100%, but trying to, because it's such an expensive item. It's, and it's a huge unfunded mandate. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, it is. And, and, but the rub of course, with the state is like, well, if it's a federal program, then why do you measure performance in this area against? Well, why do they ding us for performance right. in that area? Yeah. So <laughs> they, they, there's some merit to getting the teeth out and the claws out on that one. Um, and I do like that they are trying to keep that circle nice and tight rather than broadening it because it gives us in a really tough spot. Oh, okay. Um, and then math and science, we don't have a lot there to write about. I think that's all. Can I just point out one? Yeah. I would say not just remote, fun. Can you go back up to the one under safe school environment? 
Um, I would just like for them to expand upon that if they're going to be talking about the one that says past legislation. I mean, I hate to tell you, but past legislation would afford greater protection to students who are exposed to bodily fluids or uh, put them at risk of dangerous infectious diseases. This includes sexual, sexually transmitted infections or whatever. So this is going to be, I think, a little bit more of a hotbed topic what than they. That's um, ten ten point four. four. The third bullet. Um, so I don't know how we're getting back with, but this is a much bigger beast and I, they already do have a state mandate under that for emergency management planning anyway. Um, as we all know, I wrote those plans as well, but the fact is, is that this is way more than just what they're saying. And this could open a very big box of Pandora's box, just based on what is happening currently in our school systems with some people that call me and tell me we have promiscuity problems. So um, I just want it known that's a lot different. And that, that includes then revamping some education on SCIs and SDPs, particularly in middle and high school. Um. I don't oppose the work-based learning opportunities one. I think it's I'm going to write it like this. So I just that don't I pronounce it correctly. It is correct. Yeah, that is. I mean, barriers to. Maybe because we have it so nicely set up here that I don't understand where everybody else is coming from. They just probably don't have. <clears throat> is this not what's done with the resources? In on as well? So here's, here's. They probably don't push in for community partners. Yeah. Um, or, or even having some local control over requirements that you may have to meet for students to go off campus or right. campus or participate in the work-based learning program. There's some, there's something she's asked. Can I ask why they deleted all together legislative position 11? Yeah. Love it. That's the two. That's, they're, they taking it off. they're taking they're no it off, so done. they're not opposing it then. Okay, you, have a, you have a new, One more. new number 11, and you have an old number All right, old, okay. old no, that new yeah. number 11 there. The non-public school students participating in Virginia high school leads activities. Yeah. Yes, that's gone, and now they're, they're proposing this other one. So what they're not going back to address the... Um, they're going to allow local control in determining participation in VHSL activities within the local division. So they will no longer be using BSBA resources to advocate one way or another. Uh, All right. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> That's um, a big step for them. Yeah. It is. I was they shocked. Have, they have for years opposed um, yes. non you know, homeschoolers. Participation. Yeah. And then um, yep. student transportation and bus drivers, love that. <laughs> that was a really good one, and I don't have a lot of impact here. Um, and I don't know the process, I don't know if we want to look at it separately or just refer to governance and have them look at it for us, but the total policy platform, there are some things that I don't think mesh well with things we've already done and may not mesh well with the direction we want to be in in the next session. I certainly don't want anything in their policy, which I haven't like totally, I like to read it multiple times. I want to make sure that nothing in there contradicts like what we send to our delegates. So we actually publish something um, because we don't want to end up on a list that we didn't mean to be on. Under <coughs> transportation though, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm concerned just about <coughs> that we don't make it so easy that we have people who really aren't qualified to be funded. It's well, also right. be necessary, and barriers. also where, like people where from they, Jersey. Like uh, I'm not sink. sure that I want a high school student driving high school students to school mm -hmm. on the bus. Well, they did in South Carolina. <laughs> well, well, we used to do it here. Yeah. It, it just, <laughs> it's just that we have a problem with teachers look young and have a hard time managing a classroom because the students aren't that much younger than they are. I can't imagine high school students on a bus with a fellow high school student. Well, they talk about oh, yeah, unnecessary barriers, which to me yeah, says red tape and bureaucracy, right. and then would allow us to determine what hiring standards we want. Um, they still have to meet all the requirements for okay. the, the, the CDL. Um, and, 
and I think that some of the, the things that have been added to that for school bus transportation specifically um, re relate to the number of hours that they have to drive without students versus the net hour, number of hours that they have to drive with students, the number of hours that they have to spend in classroom. And I, I hate to point out the obvious, but the number of hours does not necessarily correlate with performance yeah. versus a driver demonstrating capacity to do those things. You could get a driver through a training program in a week versus getting a, an experienced driver through a training program in a week versus somebody who's inexperienced, no matter how many times they go through the training program, they still won't pass. So well, I think we should expand this for crossing guards as well, because there's yeah. some unnecessary amount of carriers there that would open up a lot of opportunities sure. for us, um, particularly with driver's license. So obviously this is the board's choice, but from a process standpoint, you have one meeting before um, the, the conference. BSBA conference. Uh, it, it may be a good idea for um, board members to opine and give their opinions to uh, the chair of the governance committee and the governance committee to uh, to, to discuss this and then bring forward a recommendation based on um, opinions shared by board members to the governance committee chair. That might expedite like the process. Shared with the delegate for the yeah. conference. Oh, and he just means this chair, not me. <laughs> but but ultimately you're going to have to well, you're going to bring this before your next. It would, first yeah, yeah, yeah. But it would be nice if they were working in conjunction. Then it's sort of. And, the, well, traditional, I guess I'm, I'm confused about the, the <clears throat> delegate. I mean, traditionally, the del delegate is just the person that we that elect just represents to go board. and vote yeah. yeah. for us. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that the delegate. Or, it's or, me. I mean, yeah, yeah, but I mean, you, there's there's never been any special right. um, requirements or extra work or right. extra credit or anything like that go with it other than, you know, right. when you were kind enough to volunteer. You get extra credit. In, 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 most, <laughs> in, in most cases. So, yeah, thanks. You know, if, <laughs> If the board, you know, we have people on the board that want to volunteer now. Um, <laughs> Melissa, we have, we meet Thursday, and that's going to be probably too soon to get something on. So that means we have to change our, um, our, our November meeting before the, the board meeting, which it's fine by me. I, mean, I have, I have that. flexible. Is that, is that, do you, do you want to get the, the comments to um, Missy to consent to the yeah. comments? Yeah. Yeah. Does that work for you, Susan? Yes. So if they wanted to make <clears throat> changes to this language like we just did with our, you know, our no priorities, for, um, is that priorities. something that's are these up for discussion or are they just an opt-down? Well, they're pretty, they're pretty much um, usually they, up they, down. They you, you have to notify them long. ahead of time if yeah. you want to make any changes to the language and then you have to be prepared to discuss it and then they'll mm -hmm. vote on changes to the language. Well, we, have three, we have three virtual meetings. Like, yeah, yeah. there are one of the meetings. I, November 10th is the big one. The actual, yeah, it's the actual vote, though, but yeah, they actually some, go through them all beforehand. beforehand. That we have. I'd say, unless it's particular language, I mean, if it's if it's like, um, shouldn't we shall? Getting well, yes, yeah, <laughs> shall and will are a big deal to me, but um, no. <clears throat> Well, I didn't know that. That. Yeah, well, <laughs> because of what they mean. But anyway, I, I'd say if the meetings don't start until after our next meeting, then we'll just, you know, we're just going to have to put it on our agenda me? for the next meeting. Liza, I keep, you can know, you we, can, we can make suggestions, but don't count on them. Our next board, board meeting is board. two days before this meeting. Yeah, the vote. All right. This is like a recycle, right? the public hearing and that's going to begin with the presentation of the national colors and pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
we'd like to thank Stafford High School's Navy JROTC uh, for being with us this evening. The member of tonight's color guard are Cadet Emily Burnett, Cadet Brandon Smith, Cadet William Truitt, and Cadet Junior Boney. And the instructors of the Stafford High School Navy JROTC program are Command Master Chief Lewis Wilson, retired, and Petty Chief Officer Damian Wilson, retired. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Taylor. Tonight I get the opportunity to present to you the draft proposals of the 23-24 and the 24-25 school calendars. Tonight I'm going to go over our feedback process, talk about the advisory groups and the feedback recommendations, highlight some of the changes, and then show you actually the draft calendars for the 23-24 and the 24-25 school year. We presented the calendar at the work session back in September, and since then we've had six advisory meetings where we met with parents, teachers, students, faith-based advisory committees, business advisory, and the community advisory committees. We also had the opportunity to share with our principals, our pre-K-12. And again, tonight, I'd like to share with you some of those recommendations based on these groups, folks groups that we worked with, where we talked to them and gave them the draft one calendars and asked them to provide us feedback based on what they liked and what they'd like to see changed on the proposed calendars. Based on those recommendations, it was clear that there was no consensus on most of the elements of the, cal or the uh, calendar. However, transition day was a big hit. Everybody liked the transition day to start off the day, so our younger kids, our kindergartners, sixth grade, and our ninth graders could actually attend school before all the other students. Also, our parents, <laughs> it came across very clear, stop changing schedules. We need a consistent calendar. Many of the folks liked the post-Labor Day start. However, the overwhelmingly, they wanted to have the first semester finish before the winter break in December. So in order to do that, we must start before Labor Day. There were mixed reviews on uh, finishing the end of the year, but the majority of folks felt that we should finish before Memorial Weekend. And then again, staff. In Stafford County Public Schools are becoming very diverse as our community is changing, and several students, parents, faith-based in our community came out and asked that we look at adding some more faith traditions into our calendar. We also had parents and students who talked about our graduation dates where they were conflicting with college graduations. And then our teachers, they really liked the fact that we had end of the quarter work days in order to prepare grades and get report cards completed. Staff also liked that we had a two week winter break and would prefer that. Our parents and community made a great recommendation based on our calendar that we make it clear what are no student days and what are no student teacher days and reduce all the colors on the calendar. So I think you'll see some changes to that. So basically, what you're going to see is that we have a calendar that we're proposing for both the next coming years, that we will have a pre-Labor Day start, we'll include the transition day, the first semester will finish before the winter break, we'll end school before the Memorial Day weekend, we will have nine weeks off from the time students finish and teachers leave to the time <coughs> teachers come back for the teacher work week. We also provide um, consistency for families and community planning with this calendar. Our winter break will be approximately anywhere between 14 to 16 days, almost two weeks there. Our spring break, we're consistent with having it the second week of March. And then our teacher professional days are clearly distinguished between teacher work days where they can do what they need to do without being bothered by any other meetings and also having specific teacher professional days where we'll provide professional learning. We also have in our calendar this year, we're adding Yom Kippur and also Rosh, Rosh Hashan, and we're also going to add Eid into our calendars. And then again, the changes regarding graduation. We have moved graduation to the last week of school, 
to occur on Thursday and Friday evenings with possible rain dates on Saturday or later should we be. I also like to show that with comparison, we had some questions about it seemed that we were starting earlier and earlier. So what I did, I put in a draft, and again, this was just draft for comparison. The last column on your right shows the 25-26 school year. And so it shows you that we are going back, starting a little later, where this year we started August 1st. In 25-26, we would, teachers would come back on August 4th. So again, I just put that in there to show some comparisons of the dates and that although we are starting a little earlier in the next two cycles, the third year out we'd be going back. So if you take a look at the draft 2.0 calendar for the 2023-2024, you're going to notice that we have included those items that we highlighted. I will point out though that in September, or in this calendar, you will not see Rosh Hashanah because that date falls on a Sunday. You will also see that the week, the second week in November where we had some concern with having a, a professional day, election day, followed by another day off that week for Veterans Day, we've corrected that to where we'll be off for election day and Veterans Day that week. Also, if you look at the winter break, there'll be two weeks, 14 days for that break. You'll notice that we have Easter on the 29th of March and the 1st of April. Eid is on the 10th of April. And then I hope you notice that we have, probably doesn't come across the best year, but on your copies you'll see the bright colors. We do have, we're using our Staff County Public Schools themed colors and trying to be more clear in identifying which are no student days and which are no students and staff days. And then graduation, you'll see, is on the last two days of the school, Thursday, Friday. If you look at the 24-25 calendar, you'll also notice that we have the uh, same dates, but this year you're going to notice that we do not have Yom Kippur because that falls on a Saturday. But you will see that Rosh Hashanah is now on the calendar. And again, teacher work days, teacher professional days are clearly marked under each calendar or each month. You'll also see that we have added Eid in March for this year. And again, we have graduation, which are the last day of school and the teacher work week that Thursday, Friday. So basically, those are the 23, 24, and 24, 25 calendars that we are, the superintendent is recommending that the board adopt these two calendars at the November school board meeting. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Nichols? Ms. Randall. So am I to understand with the graduation that the graduation on Thursday and Friday, that Monday following both of these calendars, is Memorial Day. Is that correct? That is correct, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Sigmund? I just wondered if anybody had, had done the math, because I, too, have heard a lot of we want to come back after Labor Day, but we want to end before June. How long would the instructional day have to be if that was actually a possibility? We it's would, kind of like buying all those buses all at once, right? <laughs> you would have to subtract 19 days. We have 19 days in the month of August. And if we would still finish by the 2022nd of December, we'd be 19 days shorter for that first semester. Oh, so it's the whole first semester that's the issue. Yes. No, I agree. It's not possible. But I wanted to really just put the math out there that we would have to make it up by having, you know, a 14-hour school day. It's not 14, but, like, whatever that looks like. Like, you can't just take days away without making it up somewhere. And that also eats into... Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, There's a give and take. Right. If you take something away, you have to add. Right. And uh, that would be equally um, argued by the public. It's, a, it's about an hour and a half per day that would have to be So we'd have to, to go from six semester. and a half to an eight-hour school day yeah. to, to, to be within those parameters. We and that's... make up 124 hours. Yeah. So well, now that's, we have our that's significant. Mm -hmm. 
considering, yeah, you know. More precisely, it's about an hour and 20 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, but just in the first semester, which is also <laughs> a little odd. So, so, so we would change all the times for the second semester, which would really blow our Oh, yeah. Line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question. Oh, oh Maureen, were you done? Right. Yeah. I'm I'm good. Can we go to Dr. Chase first? Sure. I saw, and then, then Ms. Halstead. Yeah. So um, <coughs> is there, I, I'm just curious, is the reason we couldn't start August 10th and 11th as transition days and not start winter break until uh, the 23rd and then have it go through the 4th and the 5th in order to give some families that second week of August for, for, uh, for continued summer break? Right. I mean, there are people who would really appreciate having that extra week to be able to, to do stuff. Absolutely. You could look at that. But again, when we looked at the calendar or when we heard from our teachers, one of the things they really requested that they had those 14 to 16 days off or two weeks total. And I know you'd adjust that a little bit on the other end in January. That, that's an option for the board to consider. Um, I think it's important and you think I think you've figured out the the first big bottleneck in this calendar which is um, making sure that there's somewhat of a balance between first and second semester so if you're going to take days away from the first semester you have to find them somewhere else and I, and I think you've identified that as a bottleneck so that theoretically you could move a couple of days from one end to the other end yes and right now that that calendar specifically is balanced at eight 88 days apiece. Okay, Ms. Halstead. Um, so do we have any notoriously high absent days of kids and students because of a holiday right before? Um, that well, well, Thanksgiving is one of them that comes to mind. Halloween is another one, Super Bowl Sunday. Um, so, well, going to school on Halloween might be different for the kids than it is for the parents. <laughs> but, um, so I was just curious if we had, um, so my first question is curious if we had any options for stuff like that where we have these very high absentee rates because parents can't get up or kids Excuse don't me, want Dr. to, Warner. sugar crash. Dr. Warner, can we um, hold that until Ms. Hall said finishes? So that's question one. And then the other question is, I know on this calendar we have like, three days off in one week in November that's not the Thanksgiving week. I don't see that in the next two years. But to the extent that just for child care purposes and everything else, I've got some emails that have asked me to make sure that we're cognizant of that as well. So Yeah, we, we addressed the 23-24 uh, school year right. by going to school on Monday. We're off for Election Day on Tuesday. Right. Then the end of the week you have Veterans Day. Right. And the following year, we, have, we do have a three-day week because we did add in a professional day, which we okay. felt was important, and then the election day, but then Veterans Day moves to the Monday the following week. I just need for us to be, question. yeah, the first question, and then I'll, go ahead. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, you bring up a great point, and I guess that becomes part of what our trade-offs are. Um, we talk about hanging weeks, two days during a week is a hanging week, and that does create, sometimes you have families that will take off for the whole week of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, as Dr. Taylor has stated, uh, Super Bowl Monday is a day that, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would like to take off. I know, um, right. But again, trying to find that balance to try to meet within the parameters to finish before the Memorial Day weekend and trying to get the total number of hours that we need. Um, again, thinking in there also that we may have some inclement weather well, I'm hoping we have inclement weather. That's so. just me. Um, so, no, I appreciate that. And I also just, you know, for the purposes of looking at this, we don't have too many of the days. But it is hard for parents who are full-time working parents to have these, like, oh, I'm taking Tuesday off from work. If you can't balance or juggle that, specifically if you're a single parent, you don't have the ability. We have a lot of military families. Don't have family here to, to watch the kids for them so that they can go to work and do that. So I just want us all to be cognizant of that. Too. I know you all are, but... Just as a reminder that trying to find child care for multiple days off in a week that aren't consecutive is super hard. So Absolutely. I appreciate here that we, we do have to on, we honor our federal holidays, particularly our Veterans Day, of course, and Election Day. But just some consideration for the parents that might be struggling with having to take that much time off from work. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Dr. Warner. No, I always got in trouble for school for talking when I wasn't supposed to, too. <laughs> well, now I, 
it's not personal. It's just when we're trying to have one person speak, it's distracting, and sometimes it's you know gets picked up, and it's just better if we just have one person talk at a time. But I, I see you can write notes, so that works too. <laughs> Ms. Sigmund. Um, I, my question was kind of piggybacking off what she said as far as high absentee dates, and I've been to a several of these conversations, but I think that's one of the reasons why we have the we start Christmas break on the 21st and 22nd, is because it does look nice and neat to be out of school or to be in school the 21st and 22nd, and then to give them back, um, you know, make them up in January. But then we have parents pulling their kids out and faculty uh, and staff leaving, and then, you know, how do we handle that? So. <coughs> I mean, I think that's what, part of how we decided on those dates, though. Okay, any it other? Be nice to balance any other comments, Ms. Guy? The only thing I wanted us to address was the same thing that I got in my emails about um, an educator asking if there's any way possible to have the entire Thanksgiving week off. But I do think it's it's a give and take. Well, yeah. well, you know, um, I I don't I don't see how we could take something away. So. The only alternative would be to start earlier, which, which I know. I mean, I'm not suggesting it, but you either. We can make that change if you'd like. When, well, but this, I wanted this to mention it so they knew that we we at least did not, consider right. it, and that's something that we had already thought about. But we can't, you know, we can't possibly. Yeah. Again, that's the trade-offs. Well, that, that's the purpose, of, you know, have this presentation, have this discussion. We have a public hearing this evening. Um, we're not going to be voting on this until our November meeting. Um, and I, I know we want to get it through, but if there is still a lot of questions or work being done on trying to accommodate some of these, if, if the board wants, it could be put off till December, and I'm, I'm sure that's not ideal. But, I mean, it is next year, so I, I, I'd be more willing to put that off than some of these other things that we have to take immediate action on. So if there's no other questions for uh, uh, Dr. Nichols, we will open the public hearing. Um, the public hearing, we allow three minutes for each speaker or group. Speakers shall identify themselves by name and organizational affiliation if the spokesperson represents an organization. Speakers should limit their comments to the subject of the 2023 and 2024 and 2024 to 2025 school calendars. That's because this is a public hearing on the calendars. When we finish this hearing, we'll go back to our regular meeting at which time we have our general citizen comment. So this is strictly on these two proposed calendars. Citizen comment, which is profane, abusive, or which threatens imminent physical harm, shall be ruled out of order by the chairperson. Now, we have our, our practice, our policy in our general meetings that you have to sign up ahead of time. Um, we did not write anything in that policy about the public hearings signing up ahead of time. So for that reason, the public comment here, we will begin with the people that signed up, but if there are other people who are here who wish to address the board on the calendars, you will be able to come forward and address the board. Ms. Hall, can you read the names of the persons who signed up in yes, advance? We have two people, Megan Gray, followed by Michelle Wickman. Are either of those people here? Oh, I see Ms. Wickman. What, what was that first name, Ms. Hall? Megan Gray. Is, is Ms. Gray here? No? Well, Ms. Wickman, we'll start with you. Good evening, members of the board. Dr. Taylor, my name is Michelle Wickman. I live in Hampton Oaks. I've got two kids in Stafford schools, and I teach at North Stafford High School. I'm speaking this evening as Stafford Education Association Secretary. On behalf of some common member concerns, we would like to see addressed regarding on the calendar. First, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide input. We've encouraged our members to reach out and share their feedback as well, but these are some consistent issues that we've been asked to address. 
So the first thing would be inclusivity, which I saw that you've already made some changes in this direction. We appreciate that. Our school division consists of students and staff with a wide variety of religious affiliations. We ask that you keep this diversity in mind when developing the school calendar, because planning division-wide holidays that consistently favor one religion over another does not align with the board's commitment to keep an equitable, safe, and inclusive environment for staff and students. So right now, we've still got a four-day weekend over Easter, but I'm only seeing, you know, we've got one day for Rosh Hashanah, one for the other days. Maybe we can spread the wealth a little bit there, uh, make it a little more equitable. Work hours would be the second thing. So since teacher work days and professional days are designated, it would be fabulous if you could also determine work hours at each level for those days and incorporate them into the employee work calendar. We heard from many educators who had to jump through some hoops recently to rearrange their schedules or cancel appointments due to the hours for a parent-teacher conference day being altered with less than a month's notice. The practice of setting work hours for these days well in advance will allow educators to plan for what is expected of them, and it will ensure consistency between buildings at every level. We also would like you to consider employees with young children when planning for teacher work days, professional days, and considering those work hours I just mentioned. Please keep in mind our staff, especially with young children. Indigenous People Day, and I'm sorry, Indigenous Peoples Day is a good example. Since this is a federal holiday, many daycares were closed, but educators and staff are traditionally are at work that day. Please consider offering maybe division-sponsored child care or ensure alternate accommodations can be made for those educators who don't have a child care option. Since not all staff have partners assisting them or access to alternate child care, as some do, just like Ms. Halstead was mentioning about our parents who have that same issue, we need to think of equitable solutions here. So offering an accommodation on the conference days for those educators would be helpful. Also, if you could work something so that educators who also have children in Stafford County Schools are able to attend conferences for their own children, that would be much appreciated. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide input on this. We look forward to seeing the proposed calendars once you've gathered feedback from all stakeholders. All right, is there anyone in the, uh, the room who would like to address the calendars? Ms. Brown, if there's anyone else, if you could just line up on the sides, then we can just have you come right down. Thank you. I'm Dana Brown. I'm from the Rock Hill District. And tonight, I am here to ask you to please, please stop trying to snuff the joy out of our children's childhood. And that starts with fixing the school calendar. Let's be clear, this is a calendar for staff, not for parents, not for kids. I think that you're stealing the summer and you're stealing the spring break. Staff has them starting in the hottest part of summer and the spring break occurs during meteorological winter. That's really great beach weather. And I'd like to know why you were only presented with one calendar choice for the next two years. You only received a pre-Labor Day calendar with no other options. Who thought that it was a good idea to endanger the staff or kids like that? Staff would like the kids to start August 8th next year and August 6th the year after that. Again, when it's super hot. Do you or staff need to be reminded that the staff convocation was August 5th this year, one day before you're proposing school to start? You had staff and teachers wailing that it was wrong of you to force them on extremely hot school buses and make them go outside to attend convocation. I think every news outlet in the D.C. area ran the story that it was dangerously hot here. EMS treated staff at the scene due to heat sickness and some were taken to the hospital. Staff was so traumatized they even demanded extra money from taxpayers to compensate them for the heat and trauma they endured. You know, pain and suffering. If it's too hot for the staff to be outside and too hot for the staff to be on school buses, then it's probably too hot for our kids. I don't know what's so hard to figure out about that. Oddly, the same aggrieved employees gave you the new August 6th start date for kids. That's pretty hypocritical. I remember a few years back, staff said, oh, we need to start school early so we can match all the surrounding counties, like Prince William, for first day of school and spring break for the convenience of our teachers and child care. Well, that didn't happen. That was fake. Fake, fake, fake. And those surveys, also mostly fake. And I say this as a former member of the calendar committee for several years. Um, I don't know, I, I've been around long enough to remember the former Garrisonville school board member um, caught staff stuffing ballot boxes. Um, it's in your minutes. Please fix this. Do the right thing for the kids. You represent the parents and the voters, not the staff, unless they happen to be residents here. 
the superintendent rep represents staff. Um, and it's possible to do the calendar like that. We've done it for at least 22 years. And I noticed you added a bunch of new religious holidays, yet we're still calling Christmas winter break. So maybe we need to fix that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to address the board? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And um, this is slated to come back in November, which is our next meeting for a vote. So if anyone has any comments, please feel free to uh, send them an email to the school boards on the um, website. Is that the correct address, Ms. Hall? And, and that will get to all the school board members. All right, that brings us to our meeting agenda. Where's mine? Too much paper here. Oh, you took my meeting no, agenda. Oh, thank you. I guess we will call to order once again. We don't need an authorization to participate electronically. Um, Ms. Hall, will you do the roll call, please? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Chase? Present. Ms. Guy? Here. Ms. Halstead? Here. Ms. Healy? Here. Ms. Randall? Here. Ms. Sigmund? Here. And Dr. Warner? Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Okay. Do we have a motion for approval of the agenda, Dr. Chase? Yes, um, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, move to approve the agenda with two uh, amendments. The first to um, we, we were sent two sets of minutes yesterday morning and I have not had an opportunity to look at them. So I would like those to be removed and, and returned to the agenda next month. And then um, I would like item 3.06 moved from consent to um, action. Okay, um, would you mind giving us the specifics for those agendas so it's clear? Yeah, let, let me find them, hold on a second. Uh, so under consent, yeah, it's uh, 3.01, and I believe it's, uh, Ms. Hall will have to be, uh, I believe it's September 27th and October 4th. Yeah. And then uh, 3.06 for action approval of the award of contract for water fountain testing. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, motion by Dr. Chase, second by Ms. Sigmund. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion for the uh, revised agenda, please say, oh, I'm sorry, cast your vote. <laughs> Tally the vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right, that brings us to the consent items. Do we have a motion for approval of the revised consent? Motion, motion to, to approve the revised consent agenda. Okay, there's a motion by Dr. Second. Warner. <laughs> Second by Ms. Halstead. I thought I heard you, Ms. Guy. I was telling, I was encouraging. Oh, how <laughs> supportive. Thank you, Ms. Halstead and Ms. Guy. All right, um, in no discussion, cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion carries unanimously. It brings us to presentations, ah, oh, the favorite time of year. 4.01, 2022 Band Together to Fight Hunger fundraising event, or should we say this is also a food raising event? Welcome. Good evening, Chair Healy, Vice Chair Randall, members of the board and Dr. Taylor. My name is Debbie Pickerel and I am the coordinator of this year's Band Together to Fight Hunger. On behalf of our five high school band parent associations, I am very proud to introduce you to the drum majors of our five high school bands for the 12th annual Band Together to Fight Hunger. Our band leaders, our band leadership includes Emma Board, drum major at Brook Point High School, Nicole Simpson and Ivana de Leon Cassis, drum majors at Colonial Forge High School, Sydney Shore, drum major at Mountain View High School, Josh Novak, drum major at North Stafford High School, Claire, Clara Jacob, and Lydia Zambone, 
drum majors at Stafford High School. These outstanding musicians have a very special message for you and our community. We are here tonight to cordially invite each, each of you to join us on Tuesday, November 1st at 7 p.m. for the 12th anniversary of Band Together to Fight Hunger. If it should rain, this event will be held on Monday, November 7th. Gates open at 5.30 p.m. so you have plenty of time to drop off your donations and enjoy dinner while you wait for the performances to begin at 7. We hope you are all planning to attend and join us. Um, uh, Band Together to Fight Hunger is an exciting showcase of talented musicians from our five high schools. Uh, this is the only event during the year and we're in less than two hours you have the opportunity to hear and see all five high school marching bands in concert and give back to our community at the same time. Our event supports the Fredericksburg Regional Food Bank which services the counties, our fellow sta uh, students, faculty, and support staff residing. Stafford, Spotsylvania, Caroline, King George, Locust Grove, and the City of Fredericksburg. Non-perishable non food donations and monetary donations are gladly accepted. Monetary donations can be made by mailing a check to Band Together at Mountain View High School or through our online donation page. You can find the link from the Band Together social media pages. In the last 11 years, we've provided over 300,000 meals. This year, our goal is to provide over 45,000 meals for citizens in our area. Our Fredericksburg Regional Food Bank is the storehouse for the food and other products collected. These items are then distributed to our local food pantries and other programs in our communities. They are seeing more of our neighbors than ever. Parents who have lost work or had a reduction in hours, their children going to bed on an empty stomach, and retired seniors unable to afford groceries. But we can help if we, as a community, band together to fight hunger. Last quarter alone, the food bank distributed 1,642,687 pounds of food, which served over close to 20,000 of our neighbors. By collaborating with the food bank, we can reach more people in need through their, through their many partnerships and business connections. It's incredible that we are able to touch the lives of so many adults and children in all these surrounding counties by giving back for just one night. After our on-field presentation to the Fredericksburg Regional Food Bank, attendees will be treated to the grand finale where all of our bands will band together to fight hunger. 400 plus high school band students on the field playing together is pretty amazing. This year, we are also excited to honor our military families and students as November is Military Family Month with a newly commissioned work that was written especially for our school division in our event. It is an arrangement of all the military service songs and is the first to include the Sixth Service Space Force. We will have invited military musicians in the community to celebrate with us, as well as SCPS graduates who are currently serving in our mu military music ensembles. It's also one of the highlights of our season. The need in our community is real. We hope you will join us in this campaign to fight food insecurity in our community with your monetary or non-perishable food donation. Thank you for your time this evening and your continued commitment to our band programs. We look forward to seeing you on Tuesday, November 1st at 7 p.m. at Mountain View High School. If anyone has not been to this event, I strongly urge you to go. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. I just have one more thing. Um, I would like to invite you guys to North Stafford's 40th annual invitational. That's happening this Saturday from five to nine, if you would like to come. Thank you. Is, is that outside or inside? Uh, outside. Outside. outside, okay, thank you. Oh, the Turf Field Stadium. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, back to my editorial. This is, other than graduation, I think my favorite event of the year. It is absolutely amazing. If you haven't gone, please try to go. Encourage your friends and neighbors, they don't have to have kids in school, to come. I mean, if you bring food, that's even better, but it's, it's not a requirement. And, and this military thing sounds so exciting. 
wow, it's another another first for for Stafford County. So and I knew Dr. Um, Dr. Taylor's got that on his calendar, right? The whole family's coming. When he when he came on board last December, I said, wait till next November. <laughs> It'll be great. All right, that brings us to the Postgraduate Programs Showcase. All right, good evening. <coughs> All right, good evening, Madam Chair, School Board, Dr. Taylor. We have an awesome treat for you this evening where we would like to take some time to showcase our postgrad program. We have a former intern as well as his mom is here this evening that is going to share their experience with the postgrad program here in Stafford County. And please keep in mind that the postgrad program is one piece to transition planning for our students with disabilities, but it is a big piece because it's a time where we provide our students with real life application of their skills to be contributing members of society. So with that being said, I want to hand it off to my assistant director, Annie Villanueva, and our transition coordinator, Bethany Ventura. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hammer. Good evening, school board members, Madam Chair, Dr. Taylor. Transition is such an important part of our students' lives, even our youngest learners. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous up here, but I told myself, just talk about it. You talk about transition all the time. Um, our transition focuses on education, um, employment, individual, um, independent living, and transition. Our students and our schools are encouraged to go on community-based instruction trips so that our students with disabilities get real-life experiences within our community. Partnering with our Parent Teacher Resource Center, we host events that showcase our postgraduate programs and connect our families with outside resources. Stafford County currently has three postgraduate programs. They are housed at Stafford High School, Brook Point High School, and Colonial Forge. Our instructor from Stafford High School, Kate Diedrich, is here with us tonight. The goal of this program is to help our students gain daily living and workplace readiness skills that are necessary for them after high school. These students spend a significant amount of time in the community learning on the job. Recently, we've been able to partner with departments within Stafford County Schools, like our preschools, ADM, our technology department, and nutrition services to have our students learn while they're here with us. This month, our students will even go to Dr. Taylor's office and to other offices within this building to shadow our administrative assistants to learn some clerical skills. These partnerships have actually led to some of our students being hired directly by Stafford County Schools. Another program that we are really proud of is our Project Search program. Our instructor, Heather Pribble, she's here with us too. Project Search is a nationwide program that helps students with disabilities transition into competitive employment. Our program is a partnership between the Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, RSVP, the Virginia Department of Education, and Mary Washington Healthcare. Our interns go to Mary Washington Healthcare every single day, and they rotate between three internships throughout the year within the hospital. Some of our students have been hired by Mary Washington, and then they've come back and been the mentors for our current interns. So it's really great to see it kind of come full circle. Other students have been hired within the community, and some again here with Stafford County Schools. Most of our interns have gained competitive employment by the time that they have finished their third rotation with Mary Washington. I have the easiest part of this entire presentation <laughs> because it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you all a former Project Search intern, Joel Zaraski, and his mother, Amy. And they're gonna come up and share a few words about their experience with the program. Joel Zaraski. Thank you for allowing me to talk with you. I can talk, but it can be hard to understand. So this program helps me. I work at Vomicelli Pizza. 
I bread marinara cups and pizza boxes two days a week. I graduated from Stafford High School in 2019. I attended the Project Search program at Mary Washington Hospital in the 2020 to 2021 school year. Here are some areas where I interned. The Medical Imaging Department, Volunteer Services, the Gift Shop, for the Emergency Department, the Cafeteria, and Engineering Services. I learned so many skills. I learned to follow my mentor's directions. I also learned life skills like basic math and reading, how to take my work seriously, and how to be part of a team. The SCPS Project Search Team also worked with me on interviewing skills. I loved work. The job coach who worked with us at Project Search helped me get my iPad program for my interview for Vocelli. And guess what? I got the job. I have been working there since July 2021. Is there anything you'd like to know about me? I love Project Search. I felt like I was like everyone else going to their job. Everyone expected a lot of me and I surprised myself with what I learned. Now I can make money and buy things myself. Just like all of you. Is there anything you'd like to know about my time at Project Search? Any, does anyone have any questions? Ms. Sigmund. I was just curious which assignment in Mary Washington you like best out of all of them. What's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, I've been here, Daniel. What department? Engineering. Uh, engineering. Uh, okay. Daniel, Dean, He's naming all Brad, Lee. In my, my favorite is a big cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> you brought him a cupcake, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Join our team. And maybe you, a while ago. Okay. All right. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question. Hold on. What, what pizza do you recommend? Pizza. I bet it's Daniel Mai. Oh, he's telling you who that is. Sorry. Earl. Me, 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 Cam. Okay. And the other one, I come out big at full time. First paycheck. Oh. Yeah. And me, my hair will on. Yep. You know. And first day of work. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Congratulations. Ben, why? They said, why? Yeah, why? Ow. Okay. All right, he's going to take the show if we don't do <laughs> Thank you. So thank you all very much. One last plug that I wanted to, to give is we are hosting an I'm Determined event on March 4th at Mountain View High School. Please mark your calendars. We are gonna be sending out a save the date to the community for our families and students, and it is going to be pre-K to 12 inclusive, and we're very, very excited about this event. If you don't know about I'm Determined, please go and research it. It is a VDOE-run program that actually provides students with the supports they need to essentially run their own IEP meeting and run the goals of what they want to do in their lives and their career. So we're really excited about it. March 4th, Mountain View High School. Let me know if you have any questions. And thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Hammer. All right, that brings us to the presentation of the bullying month. I'm sorry, no, the first recognition of the Bryant family for their life-saving CPR efforts. Ms. Osborne. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Taylor. This evening, we will recognize students, staff, and community members that epitomize our values of students, integrity, respect, community, opportunity, and excellence. Tonight, we recognize students Angelia Bryant, Aomi Lee Coleman, Nani Perez, Kaylee Yukika, Amelia Nix, and John Hatsis, as well as our very own Director of Programming, Mr. Lionel White. 
At this time, will Angelia, Aomi Lee, and Nani please come forward. The school system is deeply inspired by the quick thinking of three students who use training they received in school to help save a life. In what has been described as a joint effort, Colonial Forge Jr. Angelia Bryant, alongside her nieces Aomi Lee Coleman and Nani Perez of Winding Creek Elementary School, work together to save the life of a loved one experiencing a frightening medical emergency. On, sept on September 13th, Aomi Lee and Nani observed their grandmother, Charles Lee, in distress and in need of immediate attention. Both girls reacted quickly and rushed to alert Angelia's father, Keenan, who then alerted Angelia. Remaining calm and coaching her father to assist, Angelia began performing the CPR techniques she learned last year in her health and PE class at Colonial Forge to administer aid to her grandmother until paramedics arrived. In addition to being honored by the school division, Angelia, Aomi Lee, and Nani are all being recognized by the American Heart Association. Angelia is also joining the organization as an ambassador and has been nominated for the Lifesavers Award. Joining me to present this honor is Ms. Marjorie Churchborn of the American Heart Association. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me with you. Yes, my name is Marjorie Churchborn. I'm the proud heart partner to Stafford County Schools. It is my great honor to present Ms. Angelia Bryant with our American Heart Association Heart Savers Award for your heroic effort in helping to save your grandma. Also, really quickly, I just have to say I had the great honor of meeting with Dr. Taylor over the summer. He is a wonderful advocate and supporter of our mission of American Heart Association. He himself chose our challenge this year to be kind to his heart and others. He invited me to his principal's meeting and another Stafford County first. Every principal there took the challenge as well. So it looks like we're going to be able to bring the program to every school in Stafford and we're going to be able to create, create a community of lifesavers here. Oh. Thank you for your leadership. You are receiving our Heart of Gold Superintendent oh. Award, Dr. Oh, nice. Taylor. I'd also like to point out that Grandma is here tonight. Yay! We are very proud of all three heroines and Mr. Bryant for having the confidence to trust their instincts and the presence of mind to help in a time of need. Thank you, ladies. Congratulations. At this time, we'll read the proclamation to declare October 2022 as Bullying Prevention Month. Here to accept the proclamation is Olga Escobar, Project Manager at Stafford Junction. A proclamation to recognize October 2022 as Bullying Prevention Month. Whereas school bullying has become an increasingly significant and prevalent problem throughout the Commonwealth and the nation, and whereas 
It is estimated that more than 20% of America's youth are involved in bullying each year, either as a victim or as an aggressor. And as whereas bullying can assume many forms, including verbal, physical, emotional, and cyber, and can happen both on and off school grounds. And whereas it is important for all Stafford County parents, students, teachers, and school administrators to be aware of and address bullying, and to encourage discussion of the problem as a school community. And whereas leadership must clearly communicate that unsafe or harmful behavior is clearly unacceptable and that the code of conduct will be upheld. And whereas everyone in a position of leadership is responsible for modeling consistent, respectful behavior and for intervening to address unsafe behavior. And whereas any person who feels threatened, upset, or endangered by someone's behavior or who sees this happening to someone else has both the right and responsibility to speak up. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the School Board of Stafford County hereby designates October 2022 as Bullying Prevention Month throughout the school division and encourages all schools and community members to join in this recognition. Adopted by the School Board of Stafford County on this 11th day of October 2022. October is National Bullying Prevention Month, and Stafford Schools is pleased to announce the winners of our very first anti-bullying campaign. The campaign took place in mid-September and was open to the entire school division. At this time, will Kaylee, Amelia, and John please come forward? Participants were given the prompt, how does Stafford Schools create a world without bullying? In response to this question, elementary students were invited to design a poster. Middle school students were invited to create a video and high school participants were invited to write an essay. At this time, we would like to announce the elementary, middle and high school winners. Kaylee Yukika, third grader at Conway Elementary School will be presented a $50 check from the Stafford Education Foundation. <laughs> Amelia Nix, eighth grader at T. Benton Gale Middle School, will receive $100 for her video submission. That was so good. That was so good. <laughs> and John Hatsis, a senior at Mountain View High School, will receive $250 for his essay. Stafford Schools appreciates all students who participated in this campaign. We received many great entries from our talented students. Thank you for your commitment to a safe, inclusive learning environment for all. Yep, and we want to thank Ms. Stephanie Johnson and the Stafford Education Foundation for providing the awards for this competition. Thank you, Stephanie. Recognize Mr. Lionel White, Directors of Facility Planning and Geographic Information Systems. Magic Man! Mr. White's accuracy in projecting the Stafford County Public Schools enrollment for 2020.
2022-2023 school year. Student enrollment is the foundation of school planning. School districts rely on enrollment projections to anticipate future needs and plan accordingly. Enrollment projections are crucial for staffing, budgeting, and classroom allocations. Additionally, the projections are imperative for the preparation of the construction improvement plan the school board submits annually to the County Board of Supervisors. Mr. White projected an enrollment of 30,615 students. On September 30th, enrollment was 30,622 students, Woo! a difference of only seven students, or 0.02%. To put this in perspective, the industry standards suggest at least 98% accuracy or 2% error for a one year system wide projection. Stafford was 99.98% accurate. A standard used by many planners is that at least 80%, four out of five individual schools, are 95% accurate or better. Stafford achieved 90%, 27 out of 30 schools, which is 10% higher than the goal. Last year's one-year projections exceeded the industry standard for system-wide accuracy and standard for individual school accuracy. Mr. White's insights, reliability, and knowledge have proven time and again to be keen, and he is acutely attuned to the growth in Stafford County. Please join me in extending a thank you and appreciation to Mr. White for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are good awards. Yeah. That brings us to citizen comments. Three minutes are allotted to each speaker or group. Speakers are encouraged to provide a copy of the comments to the board clerk. Speakers shall identify themselves by name and organizational affiliation if the spokesperson represents an organization. Speakers shall also announce the purpose or topic of their comments. Citizen comment which is profane, abusive, or which threatens imminent physical harm shall be ruled out of order by the chairperson. Although the board provides the opportunity for citizen comment, Individuals desiring to register complaints against division employees or division programs, services, or activities may also utilize the procedures outlined in Stafford County Public Schools Policy 1113, Public Complaints. Ms. Hall, uh, can you confirm the number of people that have signed up? Yes, ma'am, it's 15. 15, all right, there's 15 people that have signed up. I'm gonna ask Ms. Hall to um, call the first four and then call each four after that uh, we'll end up with three but if you could line up because we do have a number of citizens commenting I'd like to keep it um, keep it moving forward so if you call the first four yes ma'am we appreciate it <clears throat> Sean Van Levender Bryce Baxter Bridget Farrell Kuzma and Lucia Jimenez Pull the microphone down so you don't, it's ever comfortable. My name is Lucia Jimenez. I live in the District Falmouth. I'm an eighth grader at Dixon Smith Middle School. I'm here to support the custodial workers in our schools. They need to be treated fairly and with dignity. Everyone needs to earn a living wage. Cleaners make our surroundings beautiful and make us safe from diseases. Cleaners should be respected and valued. They should be part of the family. My mom is a cleaner. Thank you. All right, who was the second person? Mr. Maybe Baxter? No? Third? Move on? Yes. 
Next is Sarah Taylor, Catherine Facemeyer, Stephanie Hughes, and Ezra Jackson. Bridget Farrell Kuzma, I'm here tonight as an exasperated and enraged parent expressing an imminent safety danger. I live in the Eastern View neighborhood directly across Garrisonville Road from North Stafford High School. My concerns are all related to the safety of children, all students at North Stafford High School. I have four children. This is our sixth year having children who walk to the high school. Every year I have expressed safety concerns about the ongoing daily pedestrian safety and traffic situations. I am frustrated with the ongoing lack of solutions or answers I have received from various organizations about these children's safety. Two weeks ago, I conducted my own traffic observations in the morning. I sat close to the intersection of Joy Street and Garrisonville Road Monday through Friday from 6.55 a.m. to 7.35 a.m. to provide you data of what occurs. On average, during that morning time frame each day, more than 17 vehicles make a right turn out of the high school campus with children in the crosswalk. These children are walking in the crosswalk with the crosswalk light when cars turn in front of them. The pedestrians obviously have the legal right of way. The drivers have signs reminding them of laws which state to yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. Yielding to pedestrians does not mean stopping just before you hit them. I cannot begin to express the emotions I experience when I see a car almost hit a high schooler walking in the crosswalk. I have directly contacted Stafford School Transportations when I have witnessed school buses turn into and through the crosswalk with pedestrians present. This school year, I reported such occurrences directly witnessed by me or experienced by one of my children as a pedestrian on August 10th, August 23rd, September 19th, and October 5th. That is four times in nine weeks, and those are only the occurrences of which I'm aware. In 2018, when similar situations occurred and I reached out to Stafford Schools Transportation, the then Director of Transportation made the decision to alter the exit route for all buses at North Stafford High School during arrival and dismissal time for students. That change was obviously not permanent, and here we are with vehicles to include school buses endangering pedestrians in the crosswalk. Now, the sticking point with the Sheriff's Office and Stafford Schools Transportation seems to be the location of the pedestrians in the crosswalk, and even specifically on which side of the median the pedestrians are. To be clear, there are pedestrians in the crosswalk, and they have the right of way. I have heard from both the Sheriff's Office and Stafford Schools Transportation about what is reasonable and a reasonable solution that fits all needs. How have we gone from watching out for pedestrians and protecting them to discussing their precise location in the crosswalk and doing what is reasonable for, our, for all parties? What is reasonable is whatever it takes for a pedestrian to not be injured and for vehicles to follow established traffic laws. I have been told that communication has been sent to all bus drivers reminding them of existing laws and to watch for pedestrians. Given I've witnessed repeated, I have witnessed this repeatedly during this school year, including after said communication has been sent. This communication to drivers is ineffective, and there are still pedestrians in danger every day. Two of them are mine. I have shared data that shows the risk to students. I implore you to join me in a call to action to protect our children. A call to action for safety is the only reasonable answer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Taylor from Falmouth District. My comment is about the unofficial policy that requires gender expansive students to have a gender support plan or GSP in place before staff may honor their name and pronoun requests. This is my 21st year as a teacher and my 12th at North Stafford. I actually graduated from North at 95, so I've been in Stafford schools for an accumulated 20 years. In those two decades, I've seen little evidence to support the idea that anyone involved in SCPS has the intention to harm any of our students. However, as every parent and educator knows, good intentions do not prevent us from doing harm. And that's how I see this unofficial policy. Harmful despite good intentions. It's harmful to the gender expansive students regardless of whether or not they have support at home because it others them. It sends the message that they are so unusual, so different, so dangerous to themselves and others that their teachers need to report them to their counselors and they need to negotiate a contract just to be called by the name they choose. Gender normative students don't need to go through this process to be called by their nicknames. This is a rule only for one group of students, the gender expansive students. 
I'm sure you already know what it's called when one group is targeted for prejudicial treatment. And that would put this unofficial policy in direct violation of federal law, state law, and our own adopted non-discrimination policy. Furthermore, it forces teachers to participate as accomplices in the discrimination against gender expansive students. In other words, this rule forces us to bully our students. And that's just not something a lot of us are willing to do. And I truly believe it's not what you intend, given that this is Bullying Prevention Month. You've all been great about reaching out to the teachers to ask us how the board and admin can help us do our jobs and help us stay in Stafford. This rule will push even more teachers out of this county and into the counties where the school boards have already taken the step of announcing that they reject the governor's anti-trans model policy with which Stafford's unofficial policy has some unfortunate commonalities. I'm not pretending that you have an easy job when it comes to this issue. I can see where you will be in a position to be sued either way. Teachers are very familiar with being in no-win situations. So the advice I give you is based on many years of experience. When you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, choose what's best for the students, all of the students, always. So please, members of the board and Dr. Taylor, please reevaluate this unofficial policy. Thank you. Can you call the names following this speaker, please? Yes. Stephanie, I think I called Miss Hughes, um, Ezra Jackson, Brenda Edwards, Rowan Kuzma, Bo Bellotti, and Clifford Heinzer. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Taylor. Um, the first thing I want to say is I agree we should, be, we should be protecting all students, and that means all students, not just the ones who um, like to identify with a certain group of people. So um, I'm here tonight to talk about the dangers of transgenderism in our schools. We've been talking about the dangers of putting an agenda before an education. We talk about negatively affecting our students by confusing them with harmful indoctrination techniques. If you don't believe this is harmful and indeed indoctrination, here are a couple examples. If you do not agree with every talking point, you're transphobic. If you do not wish to change in the same bathroom or locker room as someone of the opposite sex, you are a bigot. If you're uncomfortable with men, with all the anatomy that goes along with the title, walking into a woman's locker room, you're promoting stigma and you are the problem in society. We're no longer talking about how to help transgender students. We're talking about how to give them everything they want at the expense of the 98% of students who do not conform with, the, um, with this new group. When, when I'm required to change in the same room as, as a girl, because they identify as a man, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I can't imagine how a girl feels changing in the same room with, as someone with a penis. Like, that's awful. Many people may not know this, but many doors at Colonial Forge are labeled with one of these. It has a website on it, and, um, those, and that website encourages students to join gender and sexuality alliances and encourages them to work with pride festivals, which often promote kink and sexual, sexual experimentation. This website recommends teachers to ask students when they come out to them if it's a secret they're keeping from their parents. We have this up in our schools. Um, does that make you uncomfortable? Because as a student, I'm uncomfortable. And that's what we're encouraging. Every time I walk into a classroom, my, my religious beliefs are being pressured. If a Christian symbol were to be put up in a classroom, that teacher would be violating laws regarding what teachers can say, do, and display. Teacher puts symbols up that are clearly pushing a political agenda, a, a political agenda under the guise of inclusivity. It's seen, it's seen as normal and encouraged. It terrifies me that schools can so willingly push this. I went to a gender and sexuality education club at my school recently, or the SAGE Club. The guest speaker encouraged students to explore their sexuality and gender at school because schools are supposed to be safe places. Well, I disagree. Schools should be places of learning where students can go to seek truth and learn about the complexities of science, math, history, and English, rather than the complexities of sexuality. I will list a couple signs that are associated with groomers. Encouraging students to come to them with issues that do not pertain to the subject taught. Desensitizing communication regarding sexual topics. Targeting a student's particular vulnerabilities. You know who fits this description? A um, teacher who's no longer teaching at Colonial Forge, we'll just say that. A um, man who let his students know that they could come and talk to him about anything that they're questioning. A man who um, had a BDSM relationship with a 12-year-old girl on the internet. So um, I'm, I'm running low on time, so I just want to remind you guys to protect our parents, defend our bathrooms, and keep the parents involved. Thank you.
The next speaker can come on down, please. Hey, thank you very much. First of all, I just want to say that I sincerely appreciate that this board in particular is a place where you all listen. We sincerely appreciate that and there are level heads and you consider everything to be said. We don't always have to agree with it and that's okay, but I appreciate that. That is a wonderful thing. Um, so I'm Brenda Edwards. I teach art at Stafford High School and I am here to discuss Youngkin's transgender youth policy, specifically not the policy that was passed by Stafford County. Um, I am asking that the board please consider rejecting this as many other counties have in the state of Virginia already um, for various reasons, but most specifically because as teachers, we are your front lines and we need to be able to show the respect and the support to our students that you expect us to show to them on a daily basis. Every single student, every single day. So when kids walk into my class on day one, I tell them the number one rule in here and the most important rule that I really need you to remember is respect. I need you to show respect for everybody in here. I don't care what they look like. I don't care how they dress. I don't care how they talk. And I don't care what their belief system is. You don't have to agree with them. You just have to show respect for who they are as a person. This is what I am asking you to allow us the ability to do. So I understand that there's a big rush and a big push in one direction or another, but we are simply asking you to slow down and please consider what this would actually do in the county and specifically what this would do in a classroom when I need to look at a child and I need to say, I am sorry, that's not something that we're allowed to talk about here. And the reason that that is an issue is because if we are sending a trans student to counseling, you are immediately implying that there is a mental issue there specifically because they're trans. And if we are saying that a student that is trans cannot go by their nickname because it is associated with being trans, however, Bobby can go by Bubba because that has nothing to do with being trans. That is an issue. At that point in time, we are targeting a group of students and that is something we do need to consider. So I know that you are all intelligent, wonderful people and I know that you simply want the best for what our students have in this school system. You try every day to provide them with that. And I'm simply asking that you please consider this because if we can't provide them with a safe space, we've provided them with nothing. So please, for the sake of being kind and respectful to our students, please reject that policy. Thank you. What an incredibly hard act to follow. Um, that was be eloquently put. Um, but as some of you may know, today is National Coming Out Day. It is also LGBTQ History Month. It is also Bullying Prevention Month. So what a better day for me to make my return to this board. I actually, the first time I addressed this board was in 2017 as a high schooler. I graduated from Colonial Forge in 2018. Um, I had a student threaten my life because I was trans and then I'd bring a knife to school the next day. Um, and after that, I decided that queer and trans youth like me deserved better. And I decided to do my political and civic duty and come to these school board meetings. And I did so for a, school year, a, a full school year and a half um, until I graduated and even after I entered college to come back when you all have voted on the anti-discrimination policy. So I'm incredibly dedicated to this um, and I just want to, to share my thoughts um, as a previous student um, and as someone who works in legislation now. Um, we know through numerous studies and surveys that supporting trans youth improves their academic and mental health outcomes. I know this to be true because I lived it. I had t teachers that were both supportive and unsupportive. I've had teachers use my name and pronouns and being my true self in their classrooms allowed me to focus on my learning. I had 21 absences my senior year and a lot of that had to do with this bullying that I experienced and through studies we actually know that this is not uncommon for trans youth. It impacts their entire life trajectory of whether it's a lower GPA and therefore not getting into college um, and eventually leading to other outcomes uh, such as like our risk of uh, our heightened risk of living below the poverty line. And you all have like a very special 
duty and responsibility to make sure that these students are on the best possible life trajectory, as you do with each student, right? So um, I'm just asking that you oppose these policies um, and that you provide teachers with real clarity and transparency around exactly what you're asking them to do because they deserve that. So that way they can speak and honor um, trans students. Um, yeah, so um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I had to say. Um, I also just very quickly, I know it's, it's rude and improper to address previous speakers, so I'm not doing that. But um, trans experiences have actually existed as far as we know as long as written language, um, whether we're talking about the ancient Greece, uh, pre-colonial indigenous people, um, the transgenderism, um, which isn't like a real thing um, as it's not an ideology, instead it's an innate sense of oneself. Um, it actually uh, predates the, the colonial ideas that uh, we understand today. Um, so with that in mind, I hope that you will support trans youth. Could, could you give us your name, please? I don't think Bo Bilotti, any pronouns. Thank you. My name is Rowan Kuzma, and I'm currently a sophomore at North Stafford High School. I live in the Eastern View neighborhood directly across 610 from the high school. Every morning I walk to school, and each morning as I use the crosswalk, there's normally at least one car that turns in front of me as it exits the high school. On some occasions, some buses have even turned in front of me when I'm in the crosswalk. I'm always legally using the crosswalk when I have the light to walk across. I have the legal right of way as a pedestrian in the crosswalk. I'm sharing this information because I'm always <coughs> worried that a vehicle will hit me as it turns out as a high school. There are also cars that turn around in our neighborhood, either in driveways or intersections, and sometimes three-point turns in the road. These cars turn around in our neighborhood because they don't want to wait for the light to turn left into the high school. I don't feel safe when this happens because I'm worried those drivers won't be paying attention and will hit me as they back up on the road in my neighborhood when I'm walking to school. My brother is a senior at North Stafford. He has sports practice and couldn't make it here tonight, so he has asked me to share his thoughts. Walking to school every morning, I come too close for comfort to cars in the crosswalk on the daily. Without fail, at least one car turns in front of me in the crosswalk after I'm already on the side of the school on the road. It becomes a problem when two or three cars do this and turn so close to me that I feel like I can just reach out and touch them. Recently, I was crossing and got almost entirely to the other side. I was probably 10 feet away from the other edge of the road, and a car tried to turn right into me. Luckily, it slammed on its brakes right before it would have hit me. I believe this problem stems from the light turning out of the school being green while the crosswalk light is on. Once one car turns at the green light, the one behind them assumes that it's safe to go, and the next one and the next, because the light is green. They all just go because they see the ones in front of them g go. Because there are cars in front of them, they can't even see the crosswalk to know that there are people walking. I'm the person in the crosswalk they don't see and then almost hit. This situation feels dangerous every morning. <clears throat> Madam Chair, after Mr. Hines, there will be Deborah Snyder, Steve Robson, and Dwayne Edwards. Good evening. I'm Cliff Heinzer. I'm the chair of the Stafford County Democratic Committee. And I just wanted to come to the board uh, this evening to remind you that we need to seek a permanent solution to the plight of our custodial workers. And it's not lost upon me that with the decision of ABM to withdraw, you have a challenge right now. There are contracting issues, there are hiring requirements, and you have to keep the schools clean and safe in the interim. But I'd like to keep focused on a permanent solution, which involves bringing our custodial workers back in fully into the family of um, the public schools as they once were. And therein will lie your permanent solution when the custodial workers are once again employees of the county. Thank you so much for your time. Ms. Snyder. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good evening. Um, I agree with the last speaker. <laughs> I went on Friday to get a um, Freedom of Information Act request. I um, wanted you guys to know I, I don't think I need to need to say anything, but it's for um, the school system to request um, an access to uh, ABM's, how ABM is handling the contract that they have. And um, I, I received a, uh, um, on Monday, I received um, an email from Dr. Stemple saying that none, none is on record. In other words, no news is good news. In other words, ABM is, to me, as a taxpayer, seems to be going along just fine when we know for certain that is far from the truth, and so that can't be, because I know that uh, labor laws are, are, are being trampled on, and, uh, and also a public health situation. Now, we all think that COVID is a thing of the past. I don't know. But if, if, if it should happen, God forbid that um, a variant comes to town and affects our children in school, um, we need the staff to keep uh, our schools sanitized. And it's the custodial workers wish themselves to do a much better job, and ABN has pre almost prevented them from doing so by not um, equipping them properly, either with um, uh, suitable clothing for the for sanitary commission um, conditions, or or even supplies. So, so things have not changed. I wish you, um, I'll have to stop here, but thank you. Thank you. My name is Steve Robson. I teach in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at the University of Mary Washington. Um, there are many close connections between the University of Mary Washington and the Stafford School System. Uh, many of our students are graduates of the Stafford Schools. Tonight I met one of your teachers who was my student at the University of Mary Washington a few years ago. And as everyone knows, a custodial staff at Mary Washington or any college is essential to the uh, healthy and proper functioning of, uh, of a university or a school. And this means that the staff should receive adequate compensation and fair working conditions. It's only common sense. The proposal for the new contract that I saw today seems eminently fair. $15 an hour, 40 hour a week. Um, I know that most people in here are probably um, aware of that and that uh, this, this should be, as they say, a no-brainer. But I also want to address the decision to turn over the administration of the custodial staff to a private company. Some years ago at Mary Washington, the same thing was done to our food services. The food services were t turned over to a private company. And staff members report that the promises, the conditions for working and the compensation that were made by the university have not been honored by this private company. And the students report that the food quality has deteriorated, something that I can confirm myself, having eaten occasionally at the, uh, at the dining halls. 
If a private company is contracted to administer the custodial staff or any function of, a, of an institution, it must be carefully monitored with appropriate remedies for financial and labor abuses. This has not happened here, clearly. So uh, I am agreeing with the previous speaker that the custodial services should be brought back under the administration of the uh, Stafford County School System. Thank you. Mr. Edwards, Dwayne Edwards. Madam Chair, Bull, Dr. Taylor. Um, name is Dwayne Edwards. I'm the Vice Chair of the Virginia Organized State Governing Board. And I want to say a little bit over a year ago, uh, we, was, uh, we had brought an issue of, uh, uh, I later found out it was a cleaning worker at ABM. Uh, she was talking about how her how she was being treated on the job. Now, as I was talking to this young lady, she also informed me that she had worked at a school in Stafford that there was only one person being clean cleaning the school in the evening. And I'm I live in Spotsylvania, but both of my daughters are Stafford County uh, students, and so that was a little shocking. And so as we start speaking more, and another thing about Virginia Organized. Talk to a lot of people in the community, but as you can probably tell, I'm not bilingual, right? So and then we finally had somebody in our group that was very bilingual, and so we was able to have communication with a big segment of people in Stafford County that actually ended up working in the same schools, and they all had the same issue with this company. And then we found out this company has been cleaning the schools for 15 years. So and so this is not something new. And then when I, we talk with teachers, and they, they always complain about having to do extra cleaning in their classrooms. And then as we dig more with over this year, we're going to find out that the company doesn't have enough cleaning supplies. And then so everybody's speculating about PPE loans, what business got money. But they $5.9 million was paid to them or being paid to them for this contract. So I'm pretty sure they should have had the finances for cleaning supplies and personnel, regardless if there's a spike in, in employment or a drop in employment. $5.9 million. Give me $5.9 million. I'll make sure everybody, we got boots on the ground. That's what I do. You know what I mean? Come on, Doc. Come on. All right. So, what I, I mean, I really want us to really get into this because the people that you have cleaning the school system, they have pride in their work. I mean, I didn't know. I didn't know. I actually look at them more when I go in other buildings because of the crew that you have through this contracting company. Now, I know my time is short. If we can't hire these people, at Stafford County and protect them under fair wages and, and all of that as we should, then that we still need to hold the companies who's doing business in Stafford County to the standard that y'all have. We're in a government area and I, I did call, I did a big board construction, government contract. So Mavis Beacon, you can't work on a military base and pay your workers at a certain pay. So we had a company here had a job here, we paid them ten hour fifteen dollars. We did a project on Quantico. We had to raise everybody to twenty five dollars because they was on base. Thank you. Can you call the final speakers, Ms. Hall, please? Oh, that was it. All right, that closes the citizen comment period. Brings us to action items. Item 7.01, second slash final review and adoption of amendments to policy 1701, strategic planning. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ms. Randall, second by Dr. Warner. Any discussion? No? I'd like to thank Dr. Taylor and your team and all the members of the community who contributed to the strategic plan. Look thank forward, you, Madam Chair. Look forward to seeing the... Uh, Results. Final, final product, yeah. Yes. Shout out to Dr. Towery, who yeah. is yes, the project manager. Thank you, Dr. Towery. I remember the, the what, what did you call them, the focus uh, sessions? Wow. All right, uh, cast your votes. Tally the votes. 
Motion carries 7-0. 7.02, authorization for the school board chair to execute a lab school grant application. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve the application. Motion by Ms. Sigmund. Second. Second by Ms. Randall. Any discussion? Madam Chair, if I could just uh, chime in. There's been a, a lot of discussion about this in the state, but not a whole lot of discussion uh, at the uh, Stafford County uh, Public Schools level. Um, this is an exploratory opportunity to partner with UMW to apply for a potential grant that could lead to uh, the creation of a regional lab school in partnership with the University of Mary Washington. We look forward to sharing more information should we be the recipients of this grant and bringing that back to the board at a later date. Uh, at this point, this is just exploratory. Thank you. All right, any discussion? Cast your votes. Tally the votes. Motion carries 7-0. 7.03, adoption of the FY24 school board operating budget priorities. Now these priorities were revised based on discussion at the work session. Do we have, are they attached now to the agenda? Okay. Yes. All right, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ms. Halstead, second by Ms. Sigmund. Any discussion? I was literally still reading it. Oh. Uh -uh. Do you need some time? I just finished. I know okay. you all read it, but I wanted to make sure. I'm hoping I'm Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Cast your votes. <laughs> Tally the votes. Motion passes 7-0. 7.04. Adoption of the school board legislative priorities. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ms. Halstead, second by Dr. Warner. Any discussion? And these are the priorities as revised per discussion at the work session, correct? Yes, all right. Uh, cast your votes. <laughs> the last shall be first, Ms. Guy. <laughs> I think I heard that somewhere. <laughs> Oh, tally the votes. Motion passes seven to zero. All right, we have a new 7.05, uh, which was removed from the consent agenda. Approval of the award of a contract in the amount of $286,279 to Apex Companies LLC for water fountain testing using FY22 ESSER funds. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Randall. Do we have a second? Oh, I second. Who who was it? Maya, Maya Guy. <laughs> did did you whisper it? I'm, I don't know why. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's trying to use her sexy voice. No, I. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I only have one cup of coffee. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> I I hear you. Thank you for seconding that, Miss Guy. Do you need more chocolate? <laughs> oh, we're well, here. Do you need some of the? All right. Motion by Ms. Randall. Second by Miss Guy. Any discussion? Dr. Chase, did you want to? Yeah, so I just wanted to, um, you know, sort of publicly have a little discussion about this to, um, you know, I, I've heard from families who are upset that the water fountains are closed. I've heard from people that the water fountains were open and then they were closed and what did that mean? And so just a, a little sort of explanation. Before be I defer to, to Mr. Fulmer, um, I don't for the life of me understand why this is not a bigger topic of conversation in other parts of the Commonwealth. Uh, and I may be a touch sensitive to this, uh, coming from my previous school district, where uh, through routine testing of cooling towers in uh, Chesterfield County, we discovered a good bit of standing water in Legionella, and that was from regular use. Uh, so we can only imagine um, water fountains that hadn't been used for an extended period of time uh, when schools were closed down, um, that was problematic. And so we, we went about a, a pretty rigorous course of investigation and testing. We discovered that uh, several of our water fountains were not in as good a working order and required repair, uh, not to mention uh, that there, there's all kinds of nasty bacteria and uh, uh, potential other harmful things having them tested, treated, repaired, and restored um, 
as safety being our number one priority, it really was a top priority for us. So I'm going to defer to Mr. Fulmer to fill in some additional details. But that really was the impetus of this is, is just out of an abundance of caution, uh, really taking a look at uh, the things that we know needed attention. And uh, again, I'm astonished why this is not a bigger conversation in other places. So I'm gonna, I'll just build on that a little bit and give you a little bit of background. So as Dr. Taylor mentioned, our water fountains across the division were closed for approximately two years or, or more uh, during kind of the shutdown and, and during COVID, even when we came back just to prevent the spread, it was a mitigation strategy. So uh, when we were coming back uh, this year, uh, late last spring, we started planning with uh, the maintenance staff of, um, since those water fountains had been uh, had not been in use for so long, wanted to test it to make sure there hadn't been any bacteria growth. This wasn't a requirement. There was a recommendation by CDC to do some testing, but uh, out of an abundance of caution, we uh, started by testing 25% of every water fountain in the division while we kept all of them closed. Uh, and um, we found some of them, some schools came back with no hits on those 25% in those schools. Um, some came back with one or two, you know, low levels of, of some bacteria. So um, we wanted to uh, keep all water fountains closed except the ones that came back clean. So if we had tested them, they came back negative for any sort of uh, bacteria and we did our normal flushing, we went ahead and opened them back up. Uh, so some schools had all 25% of their water fountains open. Many of them um, had more than that, or the full 75% were, uh, were closed. And, and then after that, we wanted to come up with a remediation plan for how we, what we did to those water fountains that did test positive and what we did with the other 75%. So since the 25% tested, uh, since we did have a few, only a handful at some schools, some schools had none, as I mentioned, uh, we expanded that to test all 100%. So we had tested 25, so we tested the other 75% of every water, water fountain in the division. Um, and kept kept them all um, out of commission and covered up um, until we get back. And uh, happy to say, actually, this week we're starting to get some of those results back. It is a lengthy process, um, so I apologize for for how long that's taken. But uh, during that period, we were one figuring out how to remediate the ones that did come back positive before we could open them back up. So we were going through some some testing or some treatments and then some retesting. Uh, but then ultimately decided, let's go ahead and test all 75% so we can open up any of them that do test negative. So uh, we're at that point now where we're starting to get test results and here in the next uh, probably, I'll say seven to 10 days max, we should have all the results back for all the schools. I'm happy to report that three schools will open back up with 100% of their water fountains tomorrow. Actually, we got test results back um, this afternoon. So they are um, already uh, in action for opening those back up first thing tomorrow morning. So have we already done this? I'm, I'm like, I'm being asked to vote for something that's already been done. Yeah, so we, we, notif we notified you, it was kind of treated as an emergency that we wanted, we needed to get this testing going because it is a very long process. So we notified you, but then we wanted to retroactively bring this to the board and have you approve it, especially since we were using ESSER federal dollars. Got it, okay. Um, so I have just one question. Is there a reason why we wouldn't use this money to put in um, like, you know, those, they have those water bottle ones that you just put your, like the, the one fillers, that's water here, bottle like, station. is this, is this sort of like a duplicative, like, do we need to do this? I mean, our water fountains are clearly probably as old as our building. Would this money be better spent yeah, so on new systems? Great yeah. question. Because actually that was part of the reason why it took this long is because I said, if we're going to spend $300,000, could we just replace all of our water fountains and not have to test them all? And actually just replacing the water fountain doesn't always fix the issue is what we found. So we actually did replace some of the ones that tested positive. We replaced the water fountains. Um, come to find out uh, because the water line going back into the wall could actually where the valve is, it could be sitting there and in the valve and that's where the bacteria. So that was actually why we delayed the initial testing of all of them and we're just now getting those test results back to open them back up is because we didn't want to spend $300,000 to then have it go to waste. Right. Um, so, so we kind of had to come up with a game plan. So um, we did replace um, four, four water fountains, some in classrooms, some in hallways with bottle fill stations, et cetera. Uh, and they did not, one of them was fixed, three of them were not. So we knew that wasn't the actual solution to all of them. So instead of just replacing every water fountain, we had to actually test them all. And then we're working on the remediation for the ones that we're gonna keep out of service until we can get a, a clean hit on this. So I should point out that we do have water fill stations throughout the division yes. in yeah. all of our schools. Yeah. And that's kind of been an effort over the last several years to convert some of those, but those are actually pretty expensive. And just so you know, they don't work in every 
you can't replace every water fountain with a bottle fill because of some of the plumbing and the way the walls are. It doesn't work out perfectly, but we're trying to. You said expensive. Like, what's the number? I'd just like to know. Uh, a few thousand dollars okay. for a water fountain with a bottle fill station, I think, and the kind of the work and plumbing involved. If we just got water coolers at five gallons, a day. oh gosh. Well, he actually has a mad look on his face. I've never seen one on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Randall. He's like, please don't put any ideas in their head. Um, and when do you expect to have all fountains or water bottle filling stations back online? So I will say 98% of them probably in the next 10 days. 98. Okay. Yeah. And that's almost like a ballpark number because I know not everyone is going to have a clean hit. But since we've tested 100% and those test results are due back this week and next week, and as soon as they come back and they're clean, we're going to open up the water fountains. But okay. there's going to be a handful that we're going to have to keep closed until we can finish the remediation. And then how long do you think remediations will take? Um, months, I would months. say. Okay. Yeah. But that's only, a, and that's not. You need to know. Yeah. It'll be a handful at some schools, uh, you know, none at some schools. But we are supplying water for those schools that don't have the access yes, to the fountains, Yes, ma'am. We've been correct? providing bottled water all okay. And all we year. will continue to do that until all the fountains are open? Correct. At, yes. In at each school. At each individual school. Uh, however, and I, and I will note this, we, we will stop supplemental water bottle uh, placement sure. if we have the vast majority of the fountains correct. open at a school. If it's just one or two fountains at a school, we, we will not um, supply water bottles at that point. But if we have critical mass at a school where you know, we, we, we do need to keep the majority of the fountains closed, we're gonna continue our water bottle service. Will you all let those communities know when they need to remember to bring their own water bottles yep. or, or their filling, whatever, yeah. And I'm assuming if we have um, students with disabilities that have issues, that we would continue to supply the water there as well, correct? Sure, okay. yes ma'am. Okay, any other questions? No? All right, cast your votes. Tally the vote. Motion passes seven to zero. Wow. That was a roll. We'll roll right into the superintendent's reports and comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my superintendent's report is uh, very short. Um, as uh, I prepare to enter my 11 month, uh, 11th month of service, my time as your new superintendent is wearing off. I'm fully aware of that, and I, I am quickly running out of firsts uh, for, for me to attend, um, which is both a, a delight um, but also a, a little sad, too. Um, one of the firsts that I'm really looking forward to is, of course, band together uh, against hunger. I, I have been looking forward to that for an entire year. Um, as I was hired uh, immediately after that event last year and, and have really been looking forward to that. Uh, the focus of my comments uh, are actually twofold tonight. Um, we have a special uh, day uh, planned for our secondary students tomorrow. Our eighth grade, ninth grade, uh, tenth and eleventh grade students will all be taking the PSAT test. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to track our student performance against a national pool of uh, students and also for several of our 11th graders to qualify for the National Merit Scholarship. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to see how we are doing um, in terms of student achievement. But there's also another special event that we're trying new this year and uh, it, it has a community component. Um, our 12th graders, while our underclassmen are uh, taking the PSAT, uh, have the opportunity to visit the Fredericksburg Expo Center for our first ever Chart Your Future event. And this is a two-part event. Uh, the first part of it uh, is tomorrow, and it really is the culmination of their 13 years in school and their preparation for transitions to life after high school. Um, we heard earlier today from one of our graduates who transitioned to a successful start to his professional life at Vicelli's Pizza thanks to some of our programming and project search. But we have a lot of students who are looking for new opportunities for life after high school, whether that be employment, enlistment, or uh, enrollment in a post-secondary opportunity. And we wanna expose our kids uh, to as many of those opportunities as possible. We have 84 exhibitors that will be there tomorrow at the Fredericksburg Expo Center that represent employers that are hiring 
uh, colleges that are looking for students and uh, our military branches will all be represented as well uh, looking for folks willing to give service to their country. Um, many of our students know exactly what they want to do after high school uh, and that's great and uh, we certainly want to give them an opportunity uh, to reaffirm some of their decisions moving forward but we do have several students that are still a big question mark and we're hoping that this event uh, helps to answer some of those questions. So we're asking all of our seniors to fill out a card as a deliverable for tomorrow's event, uh, indicating what their plans are as of today for life after May 21st uh, and whenever graduation is this year. Um, and kids who are, I shouldn't say even kids, are young adults who are getting ready to graduate um, who are undecided uh, we're going to target some support for those students to help them decide so that all of our kids um, upon graduation have a game plan for either being employed, enlisted, or enrolled in a post-secondary opportunity. And we'll have an opportunity to celebrate those decisions on May 1st of 2023, which is National Decision Day. Mm -hmm. um, and we are all looking forward to that as a, as a follow-up event to uh, tomorrow's Chart Your Future event. Uh, so please stay tuned. It's a great opportunity to hear how our seniors are performing. But to make this event even better, we are opening it up to the community at large. Uh, from 2 to 6 p.m., uh, folks can come to the Fredericksburg Expo Center and interact with the same exhibitors that our kids interacted with uh, earlier that day. Um, our seniors will also have the opportunity to attend a couple of conference-style sessions of their choosing. Um, on topics like personal finance, credit cards, managing uh, dietary needs uh, for life after high school, basically adulting, uh, which is a great opportunity for our kids um, to get one more dose of life uh, preparation before they graduate. And uh, we're hoping to make this an annual thing, but this is our first time doing it, so we're hoping to see how it goes. Uh, it is something new and different, and uh, we hope that uh, folks will join us tomorrow at the Fredericksburg Expo Center for this event. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk about is very brief. Um, I'd like to give a follow-up endorsement uh, to um, uh, the item that Dr. Hummer talked about during his remarks, the I'm Determined uh, Summit. Uh, I'm Determined is a, is a great opportunity for not just our kids, but also our parents of students with disabilities to help to develop uh, self-advocacy tools uh, so that our kids can advocate for themselves and learn uh, some, some survival skills for life after high school and be prepared confidently uh, to take charge of their life um, and not to be limited uh, by uh, uh, a perceived uh, uh, disability or actual disability. Um, we're very proud of our, of our students with disabilities and the ones that uh, we hope that will participate in this very special event. Uh, I've participated in I'm Determined events before and I know that, that we're going to do a great job uh, supporting our kids and families and this is just a, a great event for kids of all ages and parents of all ages too. If you're looking for a dose of inspiration, I promise you that you will be able to find it at, at uh, Mountain View High School on March 4th. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my report. I do indeed. Thank you. I appreciate that. My daughter just dropped in and my husband's itching to get her home, so she wants to wait for my comments to be done. Um, hi, Sophia. So, um, okay, so I have a few things. One, does anybody have a field report from National Night Out? We missed it. Did well, we I actually anyone? ran into someone from the Sheriff's Department this morning who was doing some shopping for it, and I told her, you know, I was sorry we couldn't make it, and she goes, oh, no, I've been telling everybody the supervisors and the school board will be here. So apparently there was a miscommunication about our meeting night, and it was set up for tonight. Of course, this is secondhand, but so that the supervisors could attend. Oh. Um, but I was told that there's nothing magic about it being on a Tuesday and that next year they will definitely look into making it another night so that we will all be able to attend. And I think she told me it was wrapping up around 8. So they're probably uh, closing down. Just about done, yeah. Uh, about now. Um, okay, so <clears throat> a few things that I just want to comment on. The first thing is um, the kids, the submissions that were received. <laughs> for Bully Prevention Month. I, you know, I watched the video today probably three times. That, I mean, it's just aside from the fact that it was a middle schooler that put the whole thing together, the creativity, and she just said she did all that stuff 
all by herself from scratch. So to me, <clears throat> that's exactly what I had hoped to get from something like that, was these kids really thinking about it, being able to use their talents and see um, how far they could take those things. And I hope that we continue to do it year over year and maybe get bigger and better at doing um, more stuff. Um, I have made, appoint made um, I should say, scheduled appointments for visits to A.G. Wright, Ann Moncure, Drew Middle, um, and hopefully Anthony Burns tomorrow. Um, and have just really tried to hold true to the commitment to get to all of our 33 schools in a short period of time, recognizing that November there's a large piece of time taken out. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, since I've gotten to the school board and I'm going on my 10th, of course I'm fine the whole time I go to talk now, I'm all choked up, but um, what are we coming up on? <clears throat> 10 months on the school board. It has been very interesting to me to see not just the um, the intensity within which each of these topics is really kind of approached, but also the the difficulty of making decisions um, that are really based on what that decision has to be based on, not an emotion, not a feeling, not a um, you know, on, on a, it has to be on a legality, on what's best for the school system, what's best for the kids. And we get these emails all the time that say you can't please anybody. And when I tell you, <laughs> you have no idea what that statement actually means overall. Um, so, so there's a few things I just want to say on that. Um, I will never understand, maybe it's my age, but I will never understand this new push to, to throw adult level issues and burdens into our school systems. I just, I don't get it. Our kids, they stopped having fun. They stopped figuring out who they are and what actually defines them as a human being. And they continually focus on what they are, on what label has been assigned to them by someone. It's the antithesis of what most of us teach our kids. Because we teach our kids, be kind, be happy, be smart read do stuff like that and we've allowed society to come in and inject this big burden on them to identify a what i'm 51 years old i'm still trying to figure out what i want to be when i grow up i have changed the music type that i like i've changed hairstyles thank god it was the 80s if you all remember when i was a kid so hairstyles careers, I've changed opinions, likes, dislikes, sports teams. This school year, these school years are such a small part of what your life will be, but the burden they carry is that they define so much of what you take out there with you and so much of what you're going to become. So when I hear folks come up and talk about a lot of these things, particularly in Bully Prevention Month, um, I get very stressed out thinking about the fact that <clears throat> we teach our kids to be who they're going to be or be what they're going to be and all that other stuff, but we don't, we, we cease to tell them not to funnel themselves or dig themselves in so deep they can't get out. Pick something now, be something now, have something now, or be flexible. Figure out that today you like a French braid. Tomorrow you want your hair curly. The next day it's going to be straight and all of that is okay. We don't do that anymore. And I wish that we could come to an agreement that our only goal is to make sure that in our school systems our kids are focused on reading, learning, science, friendships, heartbreak. I had a woman tell me, <clears throat> her anger about the school closures during um, COVID is because her son went away to college, got his first girlfriend, and she wasn't even there for any of it. She was anticipating all that stuff was going to happen in high school. He was going to meet his first girlfriend, have his first heartbreak. She was going to take him out for ice cream to talk about the heartbreak. And none of that happened. Like, let's just let kids be kids. And if, and, and if anyone has any issues, we have the resources. So to show you that I'm putting my money where my mouth is, I have reached out to our health department. I did just get some dates from them. Um, and I've, I've let them know we're in a serious crisis mode here. And it is time to sit down and find out where the loopholes as a school board 
as a if if we can help push legislation through if we can help marry up <clears throat> our community service help them identify not just they're not just responsible for schools we are but we need to be taking our kids who need help and we need to be matching them up with people right away not when they can get an appointment in five months not when the doctor's office you know says okay you've met a b and c and d and you can come in now but right away so please stay tuned because i do hope to come out with some initiatives from that meeting that we can all work on together i promise you mental health is my number one focus for these kids it's it's enough they've had enough on the mental health note, Maya said earlier there were little spiders falling from the ceiling, and I didn't believe her until I saw four. We killed one over here. Yeah. So I just want to ask, as a final closing note, could we call an exterminator and have them check out the spider problem at the school board? Huh? I, yeah, sure, they stay away from him. Mm -hmm. Why? They only go to witches. Oh, never mind. Anyway, uh -oh. <laughs> I thought it was a Halloween theme or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So on that note, guys, just, just you know, good. make sure you hug your kids goodnight every night. Make sure you tell them they're great no matter what they are, no matter who they are, no matter what somebody thinks they are. It's never going to matter what somebody else thinks of you, only what you think of you. And that's where we stop teaching our kids. We don't teach our kids enough about Forget what he thinks, or she thinks, or they think. What do you think? So much, so much scrutiny on these kids, I can't imagine the pressure. That's all. I mean, are we going to address the fact that I told you something and then you didn't believe me until you saw it four times? That's an issue, but that's okay. I'm, I'm going to, we'll work on that. We will work on that with our relationship. Um, but there seriously are little spiders, and I don't know where they're coming from, and some of us are allergic. Yeah. yeah right this is this is not okay but that's fine um, we're leaving soon I, I do want to address um, the public comments I, I do believe that every person gets um, gets a response for the public comments is that correct okay because there was a, a choir resident that had some issues and I'm glad that you guys are gonna direct it so but if that person um, is listening call me on my cell phone my number is on the website um, and I, or if you don't get the information you're looking for, and I'm happy to, um, I don't know if it's appropriate to say their name, so, um, but you're a woman. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I don't, I want them to know their It's all public uh, information, and <laughs> okay. anyone can FOIA it. Okay, her name is Amanda. Call me Amanda. Um, so, th I, I do think, um, I appreciate your comments about just letting people be who they are or letting them find their way. I will just say as uh, a member of an individual in a marginalized community, um, sometimes how we identify is a part of who we are. And um, when you can acknowledge that, we internalize that as respect. Um, so <laughs> that is the reason why some individuals do choose to I don't know, live in a particular way where their identity or how they identify is, is like maybe a, a very, um, I don't want to say aggressive because it's not aggressive, but you know what I'm saying, like they're, they're loud about it because it's important, especially when, you, when you've been marginalized and, and when you think that people don't understand your issues. So I do agree we should allow kids to find their way and be who they are and teach them A, B, and Cs and one, two, threes, but some people need a little extra care and concern. Some people need um, a little, a little extra grace. And so I think that we can, we can do that as well. I think we can teach and be a little holistic when it comes to comes to our students. Um, and the other thing I just want to say is, um, I found out that my kids' teachers have been doing something incredibly considerate and just like super specific for my child, who's um, in fourth grade. And this had been going on at least since last year. I had no idea. And it's just one more thing that reminds me of how we are so freaking blessed in Stafford County with our employees. Because these people are doing, I mean, this is not in a book. I, I don't know where they came up with this idea to help my child. But it's just the most beautiful thing. And then it reminded me, um, I'm not going to get all emotional, but one day my kid came home. This was years ago. But this is just um, another example of Stafford County employees. And she said, Mom, 
if we, there will ever be a school shooting, you never have to worry about me because I know my teachers love me mm -hmm. and they will save me. And like that just keeps happening in my life. I know it happens in others and I just have to say thank you. And that's just, that's it. Miss Randall, wow, this is, all right. Good stuff, ladies. Okay, I'm taking a left turn at the light. <laughs> uh, 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 no pedestrians, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. All safe in mind. Good. All right, so uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank Dr. Taylor for the listen and learn that he held in White Oak. Um, I really appreciated uh, him coming out and the attendees as well. And I would also um, like to thank uh, Chief Bootsy Bullock, who was able to take um, Dr. Taylor to the Tribal Center. Um, if you have not been, it is, they're not all the way open, but pretty close. And, but you, they still hold events there. And uh, if you don't know where it is, just go like a mile past Ferry Farm on the right-hand side, same side. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty great place um, that has been helped along with the Board of Supervisors. So um, I also attended a community night at Dixon Smith. I've always wanted middle school to have, other than sporting events, always have like some sort of a community event. So it's really nice to walk through there. And um, I got to, I read about it, um, that they have a, a, a former, I think she's a UMW student, um, that took an ambulance and retrofitted it into like a bookmobile. And she, I actually got, I've read about it, seen pictures. I actually got to go see it. So that was really fun and, and walking around the school, lots of different activities and things for families there. They even had dinner there. Um, and I understand that they will be, Dixon Smith will be hosting the second annual Model UN in our own county. All middle schools will be there December 3rd from nine to four. Um, they have some pretty cool topics looking for some um, specific people to help with the kids with some of their topics there too. So um, I, I got to peek in on it last year um, and the kids sitting there all dressed up, um, talking to each other, being very formal, really learning um, good diplomatic um, procedures and policies. Um, I got to, uh, I, I have to say I was gone for most of um, September. Um, because uh, I went on a retreat, which was awesome, and I'm glad I did that because then I embarked on a over two week trip across the country in my RV with my husband, and we were two feet apart 24 seven. So I'm really glad I went to the retreat before I did that. But I have to say, if you ever have an opportunity um, to do a little traveling around the country, and I did see so many things, mostly out the window, because. The answer to, can we stop and look at this, was always no. Um, so, but still, to be able to see cowboys cowboying, that was really, like, one of my highlights was to see cowboys cowboying. But also to see large farm fields and from early morning how much work these people are doing to supply food, not only for humans but for animals so that the animals can supply food or some other goods or service to see fields and fields of different kinds of animals and the work. It's so much work at early morning to late night hours. And um, just really some amazing people and amazing places. Um, so um, I did the trip on purpose because my son, my Stafford County, um, former Stafford County teacher student uh, left and moved out to Washington State, miss them a lot, so mom had to take a run out there. And But I did text everybody when I was like, oh, I'm in your kid's community. Oh, I passed your kid's college. <laughs> so, but if you ever get a chance to do any kind of just long drive, even go to Shenandoah, see the leaves change, um, we've got some pretty, pretty cool places around here to see. So that's all mine. Ms. Sigmund. 
Um, it has been a very busy month, and I want to say if anybody in Stafford County is bored, they are not paying attention because there are not enough nights in the week to go to all the cool things that our kids are doing. Um, our daughter is on Colonial Forge Chorus, and so I went to their fall chorus concert, which is awesome because you sit outside in your camp chairs, and they bring the Kona ice truck, and um, you can order your dinner from Mission Barbecue. They do a vocal arrangement at the end with where it's all of the... Uh, service anthems, uh, not Space Force, Force though, so I'm looking forward to that addition with um, Band Together to Fight Hunger. Um, we opened our sports fields, our turf fields at North and at Colonial Forge. Uh, President, or President, yikes, Governor and Mrs. Yunkin visited Stafford County uh, with one of our work-based learning partners um, and honored some, and visited with our eSports kids. I visited a lot of the schools that are residents in Garrisonville attend. Um, tomorrow is one book for all dragons at Anthony Burns. Um, I will be there. I am not, I'm going to warn my colleagues that I, my, I have not had a ton of time to practice my flash mob dance, but I will try. Um, <laughs> um, I'm gonna video it. Oh, it's gonna be terrible. <laughs> we, um, if we come, we don't have to do that, right? No, that's oh. just me. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've been happy to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> North Stafford High School's homecoming was last week. Colonial Forge is this week. Uh, we had a great meeting with our PTO and PTA leaders in the community. It is always great to sit down with them and kind of get the unique um, needs, perspective, activities from every school. We've encouraged them all to invite us to stuff so that we can, um, you know, go see what all of our kids are doing. Um, we had our legislative dinner with our delegates, and my big plug tonight is to recommend that everyone apply for a school board advisory committee. Uh, we have 10 committees that you can join. Um, they will start in January. Applications will be accepted through December 1st. Uh, our committees are the Capital Improvement Plan, Career and Technical Education, Citizens Budget Committee, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Gifted, School Health, Special Education, technology, transportation, visual and performing arts. The application's online and really easy to find and we all wanna have fully staffed committees so that we can get feedback from all parts of our county um, and work together to bring, you know, about change and improvements to all of these facets to our kids' education. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Warner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanna say that I've been to almost every high school to see how Power Hour's going and I'm not going to lie, it was a little scary in the first part of the school year. But um, my last visits, I've seen kids with a strategy. They've, had, they've talked about how great it is to be able to catch up on work and to meet with teachers, to do test corrections. I've seen the art rooms open. I've, kids have had a plan. Then they seem to know what they're doing. And I, I, I'm getting more optimistic about power hour at the high school. I think it's an opportunity for kids to um, catch up with work. I just remember as a chemistry teacher and tutoring students at 7 a.m., which was not my favorite time of the day. Um, I do want to share what Ms. Sigmund said. We do rely on parents for our advisory committees. We are taking applications. There's lots of opportunities for you to share your skills and your concerns with us on these committees. And the more parents that we have that um, apply and volunteer, the, the more we can uh, get a, a good broad cross-section of the community to advise us. Um, I do want to thank all the PTOs. It's, a very, it's always a really helpful meeting to meet with the PTOs because most of those parents are in our schools. They're seeing things that we don't necessarily see and they offer a lot of good tips to what's going on. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit several elementary schools that um, I had not been to since I started. And it's exciting to see what our kids are doing in school. It's exciting to see our, our staff and, and, and how great they are and just how I'm just so thankful for everything and I look forward to going to Anthony Burns tomorrow and seeing Miss Sigmund flash dance. <laughs> Dr. Chase. No. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. I, I just I had no idea. I just <laughs> I, I hope you're going to do it before 10:15 because I'm going to have to leave then to go down the courthouse for a meeting. I'll video it. <laughs> we'll put it on the website. Oh okay. my goodness. Uh, yeah, I would also like to thank all the parents who are serving on PTOs in, and PTAs in Stafford County. Um, as a former uh, PTO PTA officer, um, it's it's 
a lot of work, um, but it does help to really make school a better place for all our students. Um, I got an opportunity to go to Widewater and see the dual immersion program, um, and I would recommend that everybody, when you get a chance, to go check it out, because it was really fantastic. And while I was there, a uh, shout out for Miss Austin. I, I learned that Principal Bingham had COVID the first day of school, and she couldn't open her school. And Miss Austin stepped in for her and did an amazing job. So I just wanted to, to give a shout out for that. Um, this is just a question for uh, when, when Dr. Taylor gets a chance. Uh, when can parents go back to having lunch with their kids in elementary school? Because I remember that was a great thing to do and it made our kids so happy and I don't know what needs to happen, but I'd love to know when, when we can get around to that. And then, um, you know, I, I've gotten quite a few emails about um, this, the, the gender issue, um, and I have to say it's, it's hard for me as a teacher and a professor. Um, I, it's very hard for students to learn if we don't use the name that they want to be used. And I always ask my students, what name do you want to go by? And then I, I respect that. Um, now, the difference is my students are adults, and so um, I, I do understand that, that's, that that is a little bit different. But it is hard to, to learn when people are calling you a name that is not the name that you, um, that you recognize. And so I don't know how that works. And, and it does feel very discriminatory to me that um, if I'm going to require some students' parents to give permission for a nickname or a different name, that I'm not requiring that for all students. Um, you know, and, and I, I, I understand, you know, like if your name's Antoinette, maybe you go by Tony. Well, that's kind of a boy's name, but it's kind of a girl's name. We don't have as much of that. Like there aren't so many of those nicknames that go the other way. So it's just a question that I'm struggling with in terms of is this, is this really fair? Um, we do have an anti-discrimination and it does feel somewhat discriminatory. So maybe we need a policy where you use the name that's there for everybody unless we ask all parents to, to provide acceptable nicknames for their students. I don't know, but it just, it's just something I'm struggling with. Thank you. Uh, well, I had the, uh, the pleasure of visiting uh, Garrisonville Elementary with Ms. Sigmund and uh, happy to say that all the new students are doing great and the school is very happy to, to be, uh, you know, what is it, 100? almost 100 percent full so things are things are working out well in Gatorland and we also visited uh, Winding Creek which was really um, unique because when we visited there was no it was a teacher work day so there were no students in school and usually when I'm in school there's lots of kids and lots of things going on but there were there were a lot of things going on but what I really appreciated was the opportunity we had to to walk through the school with Mrs. Wardlow and also and to talk to the teachers I mean, there were quite a few teachers and they and it was a very relaxed uh, atmosphere because they didn't have to worry about all the the, the kids in the classroom and and it reminded me miss guy of you know what you were saying you know about how the teachers go the extra way because we, you really could tell that they were they were speaking from their heart and i mean we saw what looked like brand new teachers we saw teachers that probably have several decades of experience teaching and it was across the board this this commitment to to the students but you know, one thing that um, that I, I did notice is, um, and this came up in the, the PTO, PTA, PTSA meeting, is that we do have schools that have a lot more resources available from the, the, the parents. And um, we, we were, you know, shown some pretty amazing gifts that the, that the PTO had, had given to, to the school um, and the music room and, and also water bottle stations. That, that the PTOs had paid for. And I, 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 think, I think that's great because I know how committed the parents are um, and, and they have the time and they have the resources to, to give to the schools. But then we have other schools and, and uh, I hope you don't mind Dr. Warner, but why water um, you know, came up in, in the PTO meeting that the, the president of the PTO was talking about how, how 
challenging it is to raise funds and that they do a school-wide fundraiser you know at one of the local restaurants and 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 make the tops eighty dollars um, so I, I think you know if there's something we can do to help out some of the schools that don't have those you know extra resources and I'm not saying you know make it all equal but I think we have to recognize that some of our schools are very very fortunate because of the communities that they have you know in their their student population and the resources those families have and are are you know are, are generous to to give to the to the schools while there are other schools that just don't have it and we need to make a special effort I think to help particularly the, the teachers in those schools because that's really what a lot of the PTOs do they 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 make life better for our teachers and they they help them with resources I mean geez food all kinds of things going on but but if there's some way we can think about that and we actually were encouraging schools to adopt other schools which I've seen happen in the past with um, you know after one of these these PTO meetings so um, I'd like to you know look into that I know we're going to be looking at school-based resources and I assume that's for the the educational setting but if there's anything we can do and and if not as a, a Stafford County Public Schools if there's something that we could um, you know match up community organizations or community members who want to do something with the schools to kind of focus someone on some of our schools that don't have all those resources from their um, you know their their parent populations that I think would be very very helpful but we had a, we had a great meeting and I'm looking forward to tomorrow I had no idea about the dancing I mean it's wow it's like <laughs> getting a getting a bonus um, looking forward to national night out next year because that's always one of my favorite events and I'm really sorry we're not able to go today but we have something to look forward to um, to next year and I uh, wanted to uh, let everybody know next Tuesday, uh, between 5.15 and 6.30, that our entire school board is meeting with the entire Board of Supervisors uh, to discuss our capital improvement plan, which I think anybody who keeps up with us knows is very uh, important to this board and you know making sure that the supervisors understand our view of the priorities and the needs of Stafford County Public Schools. And the um, agenda said that was tentatively scheduled at Brook Point Library. Is that the um, the place? That's firm. Okay, so that's the, all right. Well, is that is that a final? That's what the um, the calendar says. It's tentative. But check the check our website. Art students are preparing. Um, Oh wow! Right. Culinary arts, wow! That'll be a that'll be a real treat. Maybe we'll we'll, well we can't we can't wine them, but we can sure dine them. <laughs> we'll have to do the whining, ladies. Oh, I'll be whining. <laughs> <laughs> After we dine, we wine. All right. Well, I'm gonna um, close the meeting. Send everybody home, and thank you for coming. Thank you.